Welcome to our virtual workshop on the role of libraries in advancing broadband adoption and literacy. This workshop is being co-sponsored by the FCC's Media Bureau and the Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment, Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. I am Anna Gomez, and I chair the Advisory Committee alongside Heather Gate, who is unable to join us today. Uh, and I serve on the committee on behalf of the Hispanic National Bar Association. Our workshop is virtual due to the concerns related to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Um, as the advisory committee stated in its June 11th statement, recurring racial violence and hostility against the black uh, community, compounded by the disparate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on communities of color, have laid bare the ages old social, health and economic inequities and systemic racism that continue throughout the country. I wanna thank the FCC and especially Michelle Carey and Jamila Beth Johnson for supporting the release of the advisory committee's statement on civil rights demonstrations and the racial divide. You see a portion reproduced here and you can find the full statement on the FCC website. Now turning to today's workshop, uh, our workshop today will feature experts from libraries, academia, and civil society organizations who will discuss efforts to support underserved rural and urban communities' acquisition of digital skills. These amazing experts will consider what constitutes digital inclusion today and the role of libraries and public-private partnerships in supporting digital literacy. And the panelists will also address the impact of COVID-19 on advancing digital inclusion, as well as the impact of various local, state, and federal interventions in recent months. Finally, I would like to thank Michelle Carey and Jamila Best Johnson again, along with Jamil Cadre and Julie Sonnier for their unflagging support of this committee's work. I'm now going to turn this over to Rudy Brioche, who chairs the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. Rudy and his working group have been tireless in planning this workshop, and I very much look forward to hearing from our experts. Rudy? Thank you, Rana. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining this uh, workshop. The Digital Inclusion and Empowerment Working Group was proud to lead the Advisory Committee adoption of such a very powerful statement and to reaffirm our commitment to assist the Commission's efforts to expand digital inclusion and empower diverse communities to spur educational, economic, and civic development. The working group itself, the goal of the working group, is to examine ways in which that we can enhance both empowerment and inclusion of communities in this increasingly digital world, particularly in light of COVID. Building on the work that our colleague Heather Gates have done in previous iterations of this working group, we're expanding the human conversation, the conversation about people, how people are part of this digital divide. And we're also looking to assess how to overcome barriers to adoption, to using not just broadband, but also all advanced technologies, such as computing devices, laptops, beyond mobile devices, but tools that students can use to get ahead, that the elderly community can use to stay connected, but also looking to see how we can use advanced technologies, such as coding, such as advanced uh, technologies as um, artificial intelligence, to help that AP student get ahead to help that person with a physical disability who needs to access assistive technologies that requires broadband. And that small business owner that was looking for ways to access new technologies to either reduce cost or to connect to manufacturers throughout the globe, or to even develop ideas, to develop new products, to, to develop new systems. All of these are done by individuals by entrepreneurs, by students, by creators, and we need to help to foster to expand all of that. So that's the goal today. Today we are expanding our discussion to really examine the way broadband adoption and use in this divide itself. And we're looking particularly at how U.S. libraries, a key community anchor 
institution, working with community-based org organizations and how they help to bridge this divide in adoption and use of broadband. So this is a very important discussion. We believe it's important because a lot of the conversation really focuses on, well, at least to date, has focuses on the actual deployment of broadband, which is important. But based on data from the FCC and other sources, the share of Americans who have access to fixed broadband but do not subscribe is actually five times the share of those without access to broadband. So we need to have a conversation that looks at broadband use and adoption. Approximately 5% who lack broadband compared to 27% of those who do not subscribe even when they have broadband available to them. So we need to expand this conversation to make sure that the relevance, the incredible use of broadband is part of that discussion and how we bridge that divide between those who actually adopt and use and those who do not adopt and use broadband. So the working group will expand this uh, discussion and we, will, and we recognize that we need to redouble our efforts to address this adoption problem. And we recognize that the challenge to get people to both not only adopt but also to stay online is, a, is an issue that becomes even more so increasingly difficult in light of the current health and economic crises that many people are experiencing today. The goal of the workshop is three very specific goals. First is to focus on U.S. libraries and their partners. Examine the way community and public-private partnerships develop best practices. There is a lot of innovation that is happening, and it's innovation that happens across income segments. But we want to make sure that everyone is part of this discussion, everyone is part of our moving forward to this all digital world. And finally, first to evaluate how COVID-19 has actually helped and in many ways have actually uh, um, uh, laid bare these areas of deficiency, but how libraries and other community organizations have responded to this effort in really remarkable ways. So we've been having this discussion in internally with members of the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. And this really reflects a group of stakeholders from industry, such as Comcast, Charter, DISH, T-Mobile, and Verizon, but it also includes community-based or organizations that represent African-American communities, Latino, and Asian communities as well. All those are members of this working group. And we've been having this discussion, not just amongst ourselves, but also including local and federal government as well because they are a meaningful part of this discussion. I'd be remiss to not mention one person who is not actually listed here, but someone who's actually been very much important to our, uh, to our conversation. And I mentioned her before, and that's Heather Gate, who was unable to be here. Heather, our prayers are with you, and we hope you will speedy recovery very soon. Heather is with Connected Nation, a leader in this conversation. So we've been having these discussions about broadband adoption internally. Today, we're going to expand this, this conversation, have it with community leaders throughout the United States. And the individuals who are going to help us do this are members of the working group themselves. So without further ado, let me turn to Pauline Contractor, who has been a leader of this, uh, of this working group in many ways. Not only is he going to chair this discussion around panel one uh, on um, the use of uh, libraries and state libraries, uh, their perspectives in this area, but also in terms of developing the uh, policy statement uh, regarding racial strife. So, Irene, thank you very much for your leadership. I pass it on to you. Thanks, Rudy. Uh, you know, excited to dive in, so appreciate the thoughts and everyone's hard work. This is exciting because this is such a critical issue right now. And so uh, I'm going to introduce, uh, let Marika, my co-moderator, introduce herself, and then we'll get into our panelists. So Marika. Great. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be here today along with all of the library representatives. And I'm Marika Visser, the Senior Policy Advocate with the Public Policy and Advocacy Office for the American Library Association. Thanks, Marika. 
So the reason we're trying to have this, Dan, as an economist, I like to see things through the lens of data, but sometimes data can only get you so far. And we need to understand what's actually happening on the ground to fill in the picture to actually make a holistic you know, policy recommendation to be able to address some of the exacerbations that's happening right now through COVID that has been kind of underlying in this digital divide issue for some time. And so I'm going to ask each of the panelists right now to introduce themselves, the purpose of their organization, who they serve, and what their sig signature digital inclusion program is, and then we'll dive into specific questions. So we'll start with Nicole, then Kate, Miriam, Lisa, Misty, then Richard. So please, Nicole, kick it off. Hi, good morning. My name is Nicole Yumayam, and I'm the Digital Inclusion Library Consultant at the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records. We are a division of the Arizona Secretary of State. Um, it's a little tricky when I try to think about our one core uh, digital inclusion project because at the State Library, we really see digital equity as underlying all of the initiatives that we have in order to uh, provide digital services and to support our library workforce. My department is called Library Development, and we empower Arizona public libraries through grants, through consultations, through training, through resources, and in some cases, through direct programming. So as you can imagine, with a number of different activities, we really set our sights on what equ digital equity looks like broadly when we support public libraries in starting or maintaining Wi-Fi hotspot lending, when we leverage E-rate funds to make sure that we have infrastructure coming into those buildings so they can serve the members of public, and when um, we empower our Arizona library staff to understand uh, technology as well as broadband and how to teach digital literacy skills and web literacy skills to their patrons. Uh, we consider ourselves to be the helpers helpers, um, and we also, um, in, uh, provide funding, importantly, from the Library Services and Technology Act from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, who also hold digital inclusion as a core uh, priority. Thanks, Nicole. Kate? Are you on? All right, well, moving on. Miriam? Hello, this is Miriam. National Public Library's mission is to inspire reading, advance learning, and connect our community. Our mission embodies services focused on closing the digital divide in a predominantly urban community. I've been with the library now for 24 years, arriving just prior to the library receiving its first computers for the public, courtesy of the Gates Foundation. Since that time, we've installed hundreds of computers for the public throughout our library system with broadband access and robust training programs. And we've continued to add services that include free public Wi-Fi, adaptive technology, workforce development training with a jobs lab, laptop and tablet vending machines, and a self-paced online digital literacy learning platform. Our signature digital inclusion programs highlight our belief that everyone from youth to seniors can benefit from learning and using 21st century digital tools and services. The Studio MPL program provides underserved youth with experience in robotics, circuitry, and electronics, music and film production, and much more. You've learned to Hello? go beyond being consumers yes. to becoming digital creators and yes, developers. Yes. The program is an official yes, medical Yes, please, because I can't talk to you now. It's too late. I'll meet you in the office, okay? Expedition site, which brings every seventh what? grader in the school system to the studio for hands-on experiences. The program also includes training for teachers. The department that I managed was created to take digital inclusion programming beyond the walls of the library and out into the community. We've worked with families, with school-aged children, uh, receiving computers for the home for the first time through initiatives with our local public school system and with the local housing authorities. What? 
Nashville Public Library was selected as a pilot with the HUD's Connect Home program. Our team led the digital literacy component of Connect Home Nashville. Pew Research finds that seniors are the demographic most likely to say they never go online and that non-adoption is highly correlated with income. We pivoted our program to focus on seniors and primarily low-income seniors to address this need in our communities. We partner with computer aid, with agencies and nonprofits in our community so that we can deliver digital inclusion programming to seniors where they live and where they are already receiving services. Both of these digital inclusion programs are funded primarily by local city and state government, federal grants, private foundation grants, and corporation grants. Lastly, I'll say that impactful skills building programs should offer training for different learning styles and different audiences, and they should teach cognitive as well as technical skills. Thank you, Mary. That was very helpful. Lisa? Hi, this is Lisa Shaw with the Maine State Library. Um, I, my story is very similar to Nicole's, uh, so I'll just say ditto to everything. I work with library development at the Maine State Library. Um, my work is primarily with rural and small libraries throughout the state. So Maine has 256 uh, recognized public libraries and about 85% of those are classified as rural and small. Uh, they're all locally funded. So most of them get money from their municipality or through um, an endowment or fundraising, that sort of a thing. I also do workforce development, not just with the library staff, but also with the patrons and citizens that our libraries serve. So I partner quite a bit with our state workforce board and regional workforce boards, with the Department of Labor, with the Department of Ed, the university community college systems. Our signature digital inclusion programs right now, and it is hard to pick just one as, as Marion and Nicole have both pointed out, uh, the main digital inclusion initiative has been a, a really fantastic one that we've done in partnership with Susan Corbett, who I believe is on the board of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, but also heads up the National Digital Equity Center in Maine. And this has worked very well for our libraries because uh, she has been able to provide volunteers to come in to public libraries in eight of our more rural uh, counties in the state. They're all pretty rural, but the, the eight most rural at first, and then she was able to build on that grant funding that she got to do that. That helped our libraries because our libraries have fantastic connectivity in Maine. Uh, everybody has, unless they're one of the really far out islands, a minimum of 100 symmetrical fiber to the door. Most are going up to 1,000. A couple have 2,000. And so we have fantastic connectivity in the building uh, and often equipment. But what our libraries in the rural areas tend to lack is the staff that's needed to provide this training. And so Maine Digital Inclusion Initiative has provided that. Our other big one that we're excited about right now is headed by the University of Maine flagship campus. And it's all learning counts. It's uh, funded by the Lumina Foundation and it's bringing uh, digital credentials and, and badging, uh, learning to people that are not able to get uh, additional workforce training either because of where they live or any other barrier through the traditional higher ed steps. And our uh, plan on that has been to bring the training to these people and let them work through at their own pace at their own time. Obviously, the pandemic uh, caused our libraries to have to shut down, and that's where we really started to see where the holes in all of this were. But those are the things that are actually working very well for us right now. Very insightful. Everyone's been very insightful so far. There's a lot of follow-up questions I have, but we'll get through it through the panel. Um, Missy? Are you on? Okay. Uh, Richard? Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Rich reyes Gavilan. I'm the executive director of the DC Public Library. I hope you all can hear me very well. Um, so uh, 
we serve the uh, four or 500,000 registered account holders in the District of Columbia, a city of about 700,000 people. Um, just for some context, um, almost one in five households in the District of Columbia um, do not have uh, broadband um, access at home. So that's about 48,000 households, not individuals, but households, which is really a staggering number, especially when you consider that DC is a wealthy city and it's the nation's capital. And so the library plays obviously a very, very important role in connecting individuals to, uh, to the internet. Um, you know, we've got so many great uh, so many great programs uh, that it, it is difficult to, to talk about any one. Um, we are reopening after a three-year modernization our new Martin Luther King Library next month, and that's a 400,000 square foot. You know, it's a, a digital playground as far as I'm concerned with adaptive technologies and emerging technologies all in site-specific space. But, um, but back to this question about what is your signature program? And, you know, I would probably answer this today the way I would have answered it, you know, 20 years ago, which is just the amazing access. You know, we've got a footprint of about 900,000 square feet across the city, and we've got about 1,000 um, uh, computers that are wired and connected, and, and the use is still staggering. I remember when I was a young librarian, I said, well, at some point, people are going to stop using computers and libraries because, uh, because you know, cost has made technology relatively cheap, but the fact is that we've not seen any ebb in the need for technology. And um, what we've seen over the past four months, of course, with all of our buildings being closed, and now most of them are open, but only lim in, a, in limited fashion, is that people who are looking to get information about their schools, people who are looking to apply for unemployment benefits, and you can't do that on a smartphone, they have been really, really left out. So uh, my, my main concern right now, frankly, over the next year or so or, or longer is how well will our buildings be able to, um, to meet the needs of, of a, a really desperate um, citizenry. And if our buildings can't, can't meet the needs of our citizens, how do we get not just the access, but the devices and then the training and education to people where they live? And that's really, I think, the... Uh, that's the, the, the rub is, is getting to people where they are and doing that in a safe way, which is just not easy in a city, yeah. in any city, because you've got so many people in them. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but there's a, a lot to figure out. Yeah, this is very helpful. And please, uh, we'll, as we dive into this, and, and Marika will definitely chime in, but we want you all to react to each other because, again, having just us ask you questions is only going to give us some insights. You all are the experts on the ground. and so. As we continue the conversation, if you have a reaction to what someone said, please uh, either just raise your hand or just chime in. But I'm going to kind of dive in. Um, well, it looks like Kate might be on now. Kate, are you on? Okay. Um, if the other people join, we will let them go. But right now, I want to kind of dive into what are like. I'm going to ask specifically to Miriam and Lisa. What are some of the core services you're offering through your digital inclusion efforts? So are you looking basically at like basic digital literacy? I know you touched upon this at the, at the top, but like, are you doing specifically the related to workforce training, job search tool? Miriam, I'd like to ask you first, and then maybe we'll have Lisa react. Uh, I would say all of the above. Um, we do um, workforce development training. We've had a job lab open since um, the recession when we had so many people coming into the library who needed to apply for jobs for the first time online, um, we have, as I said, free public Wi-Fi, and that includes Wi-Fi printing. We have different types of adaptive technology. Um, we have laptop and tablet vending machines, uh, and also a self-paced online digital literacy platform through a partnership with the Public Library Association, we have a branded digital learn site. Um, and since COVID-19, um, we have applied for a CARES Act grant to start a uh, computer, a laptop, and hotspot lending program since most of those services we offer are not available to the public like right now. So. We're going to start that program. We're also boosting 
our Wi-Fi signals outside of our library buildings right now as well. So that's some of the things we're doing. Gotcha. That's helpful. Lisa, do you have a reaction to that or something similar or different? Different Because you all are, are kind of looking at two different spaces, right? Like Nashville is like this growing like city and Maine's a little more rural, obviously, and serves different communities. So how would you kind of react to that? So a lot of that sounds pretty familiar uh, to us. I work with a group of um, state library staff across the country on a group called Libs Work that focuses on uh, workforce development in our libraries in our respective states. And so we do see that job seeking activity, people coming in to do a resume, fill out an application, that sort of a thing. Our group also goes one step further into workforce development, uh, being a place where people can acquire skills that the workforce is needed if they need to upskill so that they can open a door either to higher education or to a better paying job. Um, we also have seen cases in Maine where if there's a layoff somewhere. Our career centers, which is the main marketing for the American job centers, have had to reduce their physical footprint over the last few years. So they used to be, I think, 28 around the state, and they're now down to like 10, if I'm not mistaken. And so the public libraries have got the physical location and the connectivity that unfortunately our uh, workforce arm is missing in the state um, or has had to, to cut back. And so if people need to go in for um, a rapid response session or trade adjustment assistance, anything like that that's happening, the library is probably where that's going to happen. Um, the, the All Learning Counts uh, project that we're working on is really looking at upskilling people through uh, recognized badges in CompTIA, for example, or in medical assistance, places where we know there are good job opportunities in the state, but that people may lack the basic training or the demonstrable skills that they need, especially digital skills. Um, the main digital inclusion initiative is a little more open in that it allows people to come in and learn whatever they want. I need to learn how to use email. I need to learn how to operate mm -hmm. an Excel spreadsheet or to get on social media and talk right. with my family, things like that. Nicole, Richard, do you all have a reaction before I turn it over to Marika? Um, yeah, I was. Um, somebody had mentioned uh, uh, the Wi-Fi lending program, which um, we, we didn't have great success in D.C. with the Wi-Fi lending program. We felt that, uh, first of all, the return rate wasn't wasn't terrific for our devices, and secondarily, um, just the thought of giving somebody access to the internet then taking it away just seems kind of unreasonably cruel. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we're doing in D.C. is uh, looking to partner with the city's chief, chief technology officer and a whole host of partners uh, to figure out how to get that extra, you know, those extra feet into people's homes mm -hmm. in a way that is uh, equitable and, uh, and, and, and thought of as a utility and, and m more, than, more than just something that some people should have versus others. So can someone talk a little bit about how successful that program has been for them? Sure. Uh, do you mean Wi-Fi hotspot lending specifically, Richard? Sure. Yeah. 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 I, I was going to um, bring this up a little bit later in the conversation, mm -hmm. but um, at the State Library, we have supported a number of libraries in starting Wi-Fi hotspot lending. We started offering subgrant funding for libraries back in 2017, and we've seen a lot of libraries uh, want to continue that service year after year and continue to apply for these funding. Uh, in 2019, the Prescott Valley Public Library reported that Wi-Fi hotspots were the number one most checked out item uh, over mm -hmm. all books and DVDs um, in, in 2019. Um, and we also have um, the Peoria Public Library in the West Valley of Phoenix here that reports waiting lists of over 40 people per hotspot device. So the demand is not able to keep, uh, or the supply is not able to meet up, keep up with the demand in this case. Right. But when we talk about um, equity and what we see with trying to support hotspot lending throughout the state, for some libraries that are that have a lot of cell phone coverage um, and are able to um, purchase devices from vendors that offer discounted rates, 
their programs are more successful, uh, they have happier uh, users, uh, and um, they're able to expand at a more sustainable rate versus that same amount of subgrant funding that goes to a rural location, fewer choices of providers, uh, data caps that uh, limit uh, public use, so the amount of data that um, you know would be useful for a right. one week checkout period yeah. versus um, for one student at home. It's just an entirely different uh, experience. I need my and we end up we end up having some coming. libraries not uh, to to not continue the program until Both they ways. have better cell coverage. You got to come in. And and definitely see two different worlds with hotspot lending. Yeah. This back up. Yeah. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Uh, Nicole, that was really insightful. I, uh, before we get to that, I want to introduce Misty, and then I'm going to turn it over to Marika. M Misty, thank you so much for joining us. If you could just, you know, I think you had this ahead of time, introduce yourself in terms of the purpose of your organization, who you all serve, and quickly, your uh, signature digital inclusion program. Um, well, I am Misty Hawkins, and I am currently the director of the Arkansas River Valley Regional Library System. Um, in Dardanelle, Arkansas, is that's where our headquarters is, um, and we serve four counties in rural Arkansas. So, in Franklin, Johnson, Logan, and Yale counties, and approximately about right under ninety thousand people um, for four counties, and that's about three thousand square miles, um, and. In the past, I worked as a branch manager for 10 years um, at the Charleston Public Library, and we were we worked with the Ready to Code um, Libraries Ready to Code initiative. Um, and I feel like in my new position, we haven't really started. Um, we haven't really figured out where we're headed, but we know that we are ready to break ground, and we do not let our our rural category stop us and the fact that we do not have these access or the luxuries of you know broadband broadband infrastructure we just keep on plugging in and trying to make sure that we are reaching out to um, our communities and making sure that we're getting the um, technologies in the hands of our patients. I don't think so. I have a truck. So. Or excuse us. Um, go, go ahead. Um, so, I, I feel like in our seven library branches, we have never let the um, lack of technology stop us. The science is 30 and we are currently looking at our hotspot lending programs. We can move it 30 feet. Really trying to, um, what they, what really they, trying the, to the is. That in each of our branches. The backup. That will be our next phase. Um, that's our, our next, our plan for our next phase. That's helpful, and I think this conversation is helpful in a sense because in some of my research, I found that African Americans are more likely to do resumes and cover letters on their smartphones, and I can't even imagine doing a cover letter on our smartphones. really difficult, and so having some of this access, this basic foundational piece, is just critical for economic mobility. Marika, please, can you take it away? Sure. So thank you, everybody, for that, um, getting us into some of the high-level programs that you're running. We're hoping to spend the next little bit of time talking about how your programs are funded and how you sustain and scale them. Um, I know in your intros you touched a little bit about getting state and federal and grant funding, but if you could think about where your primary funding source comes from and help us really understand how that works for your program, and then uh, thinking about how you've been able to sustain investments that you've made and then grow them, knowing that there's more and more needs now. So that's kind of our topic for the next few minutes or so. Um, and we have some follow-up questions. But we, again, just to echo uh, what Harim was saying in the beginning, to please feel free to treat this like a real roundtable where it, you're talking to, to each other and amongst yourselves in addition to answering our questions. Okay? Um, and to get started, uh, Nicole, you mentioned some LSTA funding, for example, that caught my ear. Um, but do you want to just jump in and talk about it from the state and then the local levels in Arizona? Absolutely. Um, so LSTA stands for Library Services and Technology Act. 
and this is funding that is um, administered by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And through their grants to state program, they direct that money to state libraries who can then uh, support statewide services or choose to subgrant it out. Um, I work in uh, on digital inclusion initiatives, and all of my projects are entirely funded by this LSTA funding that we have coming into the state. Um, at the same time, um, in Arizona, we offer a number of subgrant opportunities to libraries to uh, direct, design, and manage locally relevant projects. So this can look anything like supporting digital literacy trainers, uh, building or expanding a computer lab, um, any number of public programming, um, and in some cases, expanding um, library Wi-Fi networks or and library uh, broadband connectivity through things like TV white space. Um, and we've also had uh, libraries choose to fund hotspot lending programs in conjunction with other programs through these LSTA subgrants. So for us, this federal funding is really critical for all of the projects that we do. Um, we don't tend to apply for a lot of national grants because of this um, federal funding that we already have coming in. Um, and that's how the bulk of our digital inclusion initiatives are, are funded. Great. And please, go ahead. I was going to say, I will piggyback on what Nicole said. Uh, LSTA funding is very uh, important for our program, too. We receive LSTA funding every year, and we've applied that to purchasing devices for uh, our training classes. We have mobile labs that we furnish with LSTA funding that have tablets and laptops that we take out into the community. Um, we've also used LSTA funding uh, for staff. Last year, we received um, funding to um, provide two Spanish-speaking instructors that we were able to provide digital literacy training in the Spanish community, as, in the Hispanic community as well. Um, we also re receive a lot of private foundation funding for our senior digital inclusion program. There are several senior organizations in the community that support our program. And we've also applied for and received uh, several corporate grants, including grants from Comcast, and the Google Fiber and the uh, Bank of America as well. And I, I will also add, while we're talking about partners, we do have a lot of funding partners, but we also have partners that provide programmatic support. They yep. provide uh, helpers in the classroom. They provide mentorship uh, for people. So partners provide a range of services for our digital inclusion program. It's, uh, that, that piece on the corporate, um, you know, completing that partnership and funding is really interesting. Uh, I just want to step in one second. If you are not a panelist, can you please go on mute? Um, Susan Allen, if you can hear me, can you please go on mute? Sorry, Marika. I am go. on mute. I am on mute. Okay. Yeah. Marika. Okay. So um, I'm on Richard, mute, yeah. Okay, Richard. I was. We were wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the local funding and how that works with public libraries, because I think it's important for people to understand um, the impact of uh, municipal funding on what library services you're able to provide. And thinking, you mentioned the building piece in particular, and I know the DC Public Library. I can't wait till it opens, but. Um, has you know been undergoing the renovations for a number of years, but could you talk maybe add on a little bit about the the building structure? I was curious of the point you were making earlier on that. Um, sure. So you know we've been really fortunate in in uh, DC over the past ten years or so. There's been just a, uh, a an amazing investment in libraries by. Uh, by successive mayoral administrations. It is a real point of pride in the city. Uh, so most, the overwhelming amount of our funding um, has come from the city. Of course, uh, we are the state library for Washington, D.C., so we do use LSTA funds 
for some of our more innovative programs. We do partner with uh, corporations like Google and Comcast for specific programs. Um, but I think the one thing that, uh, to, to, your, to your question about the capital program, uh, you know, because the city has invested so much money in our, in our capital projects, we, are, um, we really draw a line in terms of not moving forward with capital projects unless the city is going to be willing to do the ongoing investment in the operating uh, the, you know, I've been in situations in the past where you get this beautiful new building and then, so sorry, we have no money to put anything in it. So, um, so that's something that, that I and, uh, and the library's board is really adamant about when we work with our elected officials is, Hey, this is great. We're going to get a new 20,000 square foot branch. We also need, you know, what we call the operating impact on, on the capital project. And that is really, really crucial. Um, you know, again, it, it's in some ways it's been an embarrassment of riches in, in Washington D.C. Um, there are very few uh, large cities that have invested in libraries as, as, as D.C. has, but um, but it's something, especially now as the, as the downturn is imminent, we have to make sure that the um, that the ongoing investment within the buildings um, is there. And I think this is yep. where um, the the where data comes into play here, where you can see where, where the need is the greatest for our digital inclusion efforts. And in a city like Washington, D.C., where you've got basically underserved communities of color concentrated in the eastern part of the city, it's, um, it's pretty easy for us to know where we have to put our, our, our resources. So I know a lot of this conversation revolves around just underlying funding. And Richard, you talked about like the planning piece, if you're not going to have support um, why you do it at all unless you know it's going to keep coming. And that's kind of what I want to touch on is, you know, I wish I had a magic wand to help make it rain for you all to, like, build out the support you all need. But if funding is not an issue, what would be, like, your top two barriers to enacting a successfully scaled digital inclusion program? So, Lisa, I want to start with you and then maybe get some reaction because you all have to do a lot with very few resources, all of you. Absolutely. That's that's always the, the biggest thing when we ask our libraries, what do you need? And you're like, money. And we're like, for what? <laughs> um, I feel Richard's pain on a lot of things that he's mentioned. Um, I was a library director at a, a rural library up north a few years ago. We did a hotspot lending program, and it was successful in the sense that everybody wanted it. But uh, carrier strength is very limited in Maine. Um, certain areas only pick up certain carriers, and that's it. Um, so not to belabor that program, uh, that problem too much. Uh, th th I guess I'm at a point with our digital literacy in Maine where uh, hotspot lending has really become a Band-Aid. And I'm not saying it's not necessary. If you're bleeding, you need a bandage. Right. But right. we're bleeding very heavily. And uh, I had a meeting with one of my other colleagues who's on an all uh, learning counts uh, grant funded program with me on the low income subcommittee and they had a discussion recently with some of their um, people that are using this about getting some hot spots out to them so that they can continue their learning and they said don't bother there's no there's no carrier out here that's going to work that's that's just not going to work for us and so um, hot spot lending right now is getting to a point for us where it's taking more money then it's giving us in return for service. Um, the Public Library Association had a really exciting um, grant opportunity recently for us to be able to uh, let our libraries that are designated as rural and remote by IMLS standards to apply to get hotspots. The problem was that the carrier they were partnering with was Sprint. And where Sprint works in Maine and where the libraries are that qualify as rural and remote, those maps do not overlap. And so that's very frustrating. So that's one thing I would say is when we're putting out um, opportunities, grant funding or whatever, uh, to give either a little more latitude for the libraries to know what carriers or what products or what things are going to work in their area. Um, I know that there are people that want to partner and get their stuff out there, but they just may not work for where we are, and, and, and that's, that's just frustrating. Um, the other thing I think I would say is, you know, we really need to focus on 
getting actual infrastructure out there. It's it's so hard to figure out which carriers are going to work in which part of the states. And in some parts, you know, they don't work at all. It's not uncommon for people who work around the state in Maine, like I normally do, to carry two phones, the U.S. cellular phone and the Verizon phone, because one will work in one part of the state, but not the other and vice versa. And right. we do have some highly optimistic carriers that are like, oh, we're bringing stuff to your area, but when we field test, it's just not working yet. Um, I love our carriers. I love our providers, but we, we need some uh, we need some honesty and, and a kind of yeah. reality check about what's working where with geography. Um, and I yeah. think the one thing that really worked well over the last few months that the FCC did is really pushing for libraries to be able to throw their signal as far as they could. Um, mm-hmm. That made a very big difference. We've kind of been behind that thinking in Maine for quite a while anyways, but mm-hmm. um, it, people were kind of afraid that they were pushing the envelope there. And, and that's just huge. Uh, we've got so much geography, mountains and right. valleys and everything to cover here. So that was something that was really good. So, yeah, give us more latitude, I would say, on what we can do with the connectivity that we've had. Give us more latitude in partnering and um, not depend so much on the hotspot lending because that's that's just taking us around in circles. Nicole, do you have a reaction to that or other barriers that are not funding related? Yeah. Oh man, uh, Lisa, you touched on so many things and I just, uh, I, I really feel, I really feel for those situations and we see the exact same. How are we uh, expanding the library's already stretched role that they have in this situation uh, with the limited resources that they have? Um, I was thinking back to 2018, because a lot of the issues that I was seeing back then when I first started doing this work are really um, coming to a head now during this crisis. Um, And they continue to be some of the barriers that I'm observing. Um, And I'd really say, even if funding wasn't an issue, um, it's really the communication or the conversations and the communication that's going on at the local level that um, just has to continue to happen to really proves that there is demand and need for broadband connectivity to everybody's homes individually and not just relying on public uh, community anchor institutions. Um, Because in rural parts of the state, um, we don't have, um, you know, 100 megs at all of our libraries. Um, In 2018, we only had uh, 25% of our libraries serving populations under 50,000 meeting the FCC's benchmark of 100 megabits per second. And we only had 11% of our library serving populations over 50% meeting that threshold of one gigabyte per second. So the infrastructure itself um, wasn't, uh, isn't even up to speed to deliver some of the basic library services that are expected by a lot of patrons. Um, so I would just flag that there's some conversations at the local, local level. Um, I also was interested in 2018 as I was seeing more of a trend of public Wi-Fi being shut off um, after the library building itself was closed. And I thought that that was an isolated instance at first, and I started to notice it more and more in conversations. And when I looked, um, I added questions to our annual public library uh, survey, and the data showed that 50% of libraries shut the Wi-Fi off um, after business hours or only for an extended amount of hours. Um, That data was from before the pandemic hit and we did see a number of libraries uh, go to 24 seven access or, um, you know, be able to expand their hours in some way. We also saw libraries rapidly come up with solutions like extending their Wi-Fi out to the parking lot, repositioning routers, um, Mm -hmm. even buying new equipment to do that type of thing. But, The reason why so many libraries had to struggle to get there was, um, you know, it wasn't valued in the first place to be offering that sort of ubiquitous service. I I would like to respond to one thing, Nicole, because we used to turn our Wi-Fi off after the library closed also. And one of the concerns that led to that decision was we didn't want to have children sitting around the library in some of the urban neighborhoods where we had libraries, we felt it might be dangerous. So that was one of the 
the reasons we turned our Wi-Fi off when the buildings were closed. But since COVID-19, Wi-Fi has stayed on 24-7, and we're also uh, purchasing uh, signal boosters so we can increase our Wi-Fi outside of the library. That's really interesting, Maria. You know, this, this pandemic is trying to change the paradigm of a lot of things and how we view pieces. Marika? Yeah, um, we have one more question, but Nicole, I know um, from previous presentations that you've done and talking to you that you also work with some of the tribes in Arizona, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could just Nicole. touch on what they're experiencing in some of the more remote locations, and particularly around digital inclusion and digital literacy, but of course, the broadband access piece is, is part of all of that, too. So if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about your experience on those topics, that would be great to add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, um, you know, it's a little bit difficult um, and actually impossible to talk about uh, all tribal libraries um, in one fell swoop because they're all, um, you know, distinct. They all serve uh, individual Native nations um, that exercise uh, sovereignty over their lands and how they provide services. Um, but in the ways that we are able to partner with tribal libraries to offer different public programming or to provide access to some of our resources, um, we've really found that to be a um, supportive relationship that we like to to foster. Um, the Kind of heartbreaking thing that I've noticed in the past couple months that's hard to get out of my head is actually that um, some of our uh, tribal library staff that we're in communication with and that we support through um, continuing education, through other services um, and professional development, uh, they themselves don't have internet access at home. So it doesn't matter if we can come up with the best uh, project or um, virtual conference if they don't have access to it in the first place. Um, there's 1.3 million Arizonans who don't have broadband access at home, and a lot of those are library staff um, on tribal lands as well as in rural parts of the state and um, just in low-income areas in the valley. So a lot of those same connectivity issues expand um, for working with our tribal libraries as well. Um, before COVID, we also support um, like community archiving and digitization projects at the tribal libraries to really expand their role as culture keepers and access providers where um, people from the public are able to uh, learn the digital literacy skills needed to participate in telling one's own story and reclaiming records and um, their digital heritage um, while also using the library as that critical piece for access to technology and the internet to do those things. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick, just to, uh, just to say that, that one, of, one of the signature programs that I was, wasn't gonna be able to talk about this morning was um, an IMLS funded program that DC Public Library has gotten called the Memory Lab, where we have been able to train a number of libraries across the country, including some rural and, um, uh, and other libraries around personal digital archiving. And it's been a just a phenomenally successful program, having people learn how to transfer these antiquated uh, formats onto cloud storage has been a, just an incredible, incredible uh, service that we've been offering for the past few years. Absolutely, and, and Richard, we use the Memory Lab resources in our training because it's so well done. And I believe that awesome. was uh, IMLS funded grant opportunity as well. That's right. Um, yeah, those are a couple of big IMLS grants that we got for, for the Memory Lab. Yes, and it, it may seem a little disconnected with the role of uh, digitization and community archives and digital inclusion, but it's actually uh, allowing libraries to, um, one, expand their role, but I was just speaking with a, uh, co a community college library that serves the tribal community, um, and they have a lot of um, lectures that they had still on VHS tapes that they needed to rapidly digitize in order to support some of their distance education. Um, there's also critical records that are um, you know, related to the tribe and to um, the culture that can be preserved as well. Um, and the time is really now for that to act. Yeah, it's intricately involved with digital inclusion. I think having individuals uh, develop the skills um, and, um, and, and uh, the strength to, to work with, with these, these uh, new technologies that they were unfamiliar with, 
I think it gives them a, a, a level of confidence to uh, to try new things and really just become be better sort of digital citizens. So I think it's, it's a mm -hmm. huge component of an overall digital digital literacy program. I would I would like to add this, and I think that Lisa, number one, you hit the nail on the head in so many different areas that it's hard for us to share because you basically said everything that we're thinking. Um, but in Arkansas specifically, we have um, a terrible, like, we would just prefer to have competition um, with providers. There, there are a limited number of providers, and so therefore there is no competition, and the people who actually have the businesses can charge whatever they want with the amount of service or lack thereof that they wish. Um, and that applies to a cell phone coverage, that applies to the infrastructure of the, um, the internet. And so a lot of times we are um, at their mercy. And I give an example of just one of our branches, our library branches, just here recently, that um, we have fiber connectivity just in the past two years, six of our seven library branches, added fiber connectivity because of our e-rate funding. However, we were without internet for one week, no internet whatsoever, because the, they did not come, they would not send a service a technician out to help us. And when you are in, you're just at their wheel. And that would not happen anywhere else. <laughs> but when right, you're right. in a small and rural area, yeah. You're at their wheel. And so, um, you know, we did, I did notify, um, I did notify management and I told them that this is government funding and that this is, but you know, this, it, it really, it comes down to a, um, an issue of a service provider. Had we had other options, what would, they would be a little bit more respectful. Right. Um, There's no accountability or transparency, Misty. That's a huge point. Thank you for bringing that up. I think mapping would also help out with that a lot mm -hmm. because the fact that if if the SEC had accurate mappings, um, then number one, library staff would not have to do this. Um, we are using our administration, like we are doing this work for them. Um, right now, and we're trying to do the proof of concept work, the hotspot lending programs. We are having to take these maps, and we are trying to assess this ourselves. Wow. And wow. you know, um, in order to even do a hotspot lending program, I pulled out a map, a bookmobile map from 1982, just to see what it would look like to put out possible options for a mobile beacon, like a mobile um, area of where it's good to have a, a mobile wireless hotspot hot, hot hub, you know, where these were areas that were, and you're talking about 3,000 square miles. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Thanks for bringing that up. I think it kind of brings us to our next point. Sorry, Mariah, go ahead. Misty made me think, I, I think, Misty, that um, you were doing some partnerships around, particularly in response to libraries having to be closed because of the pandemic and how to make sure families and children going to school and everything have access where they might have come into the library. So what can the library do now? And I think you might have been looking at some partnerships with local businesses to provide Wi-Fi access points. And your point about the Traveling Mobile made, made me think about that, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that partnership and then some other partnerships that have helped you scale what it is that you're trying to do to make sure people are connected and receiving this digital skills training. Right. Well, and right now, um, unfortunately, this was a barrier for us specifically. I work, um, our regional library system, although we serve you know, 90,000 people, um, our staff is very limited. And so we had some barriers in trying to get the um, IMLS, you know, funding. And we ran into some barriers with the, the grant.gov. And, you know, we that was just a little bit more than we were able to do. Um, but 
we would really like to, and we're working to try to do a um, kind of a hotspot hub where in between each of our library branches, we have a, a Wi-Fi spot where people can access the Wi-Fi without having to drive so far into town to try to get onto the Wi-Fi or connect. And we're trying to, um, we're working with the rural fire departments actually, um, because every small little community has a rural fire department. Um, and you know that more than likely they're being watched by the community and it's safe and it would take nothing to have equipment and a router and actually the um, you know an antenna put and tried to put the the Wi-Fi on that as opposed to using these hot spots that we're relying on a service provider that may not work that's real interesting please uh, I'm going to back up for a sec sorry go ahead someone had another no. go ahead I want to back up for a second and try to get uh, maybe everyone to chime in here, you know, because we're getting close to time and, you know, it's such a meaty topic. We have very little amount of time to get to this. But if you, you know, had your way, what are you thinking would be like the top two solutions in your mind to implement a successful, like, skills building effort, you know, through like digital skills being effort through your library or your partnership? So uh, I know you, a lot of you have thought about this. Um, so again, funding not being an issue or a side of that, what do you think would be the top two solutions you would try to recommend uh, implement either at the state or federal or local level? Marion, I'd love to get you to start that reaction and then go around to everyone. I think for us, um, Heron, partnerships are key to scaling a successful program. Uh, we've been successful at acquiring um, I want to say hundreds of programs, and I don't think I'd be wrong by saying that hundreds of partners. Um, we have, for example, partnerships with um, a local volunteer agency in the city that helps us uh, supply the staff that we need to sustain and scale a program. It's a volunteer uh, agency that provides uh, staff from local tech companies lots of times to help us out. Um, also, I think that it's important to include um, training classes that take into account of the different learning styles that people have. So we yeah. offer a variety of training programs. We have formal um, classroom training. We have informal training where people sit around a table and learn skills. Um, we also have a mentoring program and we have an online learning program as well. The other thing I'll end by saying is I believe that successful programs also need to teach cognitive skills as well as technical skills because surveys show that a lot of adults have devices and they have broadband access, but they don't feel competent or comfortable going beyond say email or reading a book or the news online. We have to teach them how to use these tools to improve and enhance their lives. Thank you, that's really interesting, especially about the volunteer partnership piece. Um, Richard? Um, thanks. So a um, couple of things swimming in my head. I think we have one issue that I think lots of libraries have is that even when you've got money for training, you don't necessarily get the um, you don't necessarily get the audience that you need or want to see in that training. And I think right. uh, Marianne just spoke to the fact that we need informal ways of doing things. So I think, uh, you know, one solution that we're looking at at the library is, um, and this is definitely funding, uh, we'll need funding for it, is uh, creating this uh, sort of digital citizenry fellowship that will um, basically hire uh, young men and women of color to become sort of digital ambassadors in uh, parts of town that are, frankly, far from the library's doors. I think it's really a question of 
where we see where we make the most impact is when uh, we're not giving a class, but we're doing sort of one on one or on demand training. Mm -hmm. And so doing this sort of on demand training um, in a more sort of organic fashion uh, conducted by people who look, frankly, like the people who are the recipients of this training, I think is crucial. Uh, just too many people are just uh, to the, and the previous speaker made the same comment. Too many individuals, I think, are comfortable with low levels of digital literacy. The fact is that, you know, in order to become a, a productive person, you need more sophisticated, um, you, you just need more tools in, in, in the toolbox than a lot of people currently have. And that's why they end up, you know, uh, struggling to do basic work or just giving up and spending time looking at, you know, uh, cute cat videos on YouTube or something like that. So, um, so I think it, it really does require a, a an army of trainers training people in new ways and training right. people, frankly, more, more often than not, outside of our library walls. So, right. Richard, have you have you all uh, done? Have you all, has someone else probably done this in the past? You know, Mary, you you talked about other like volunteer digital fellows. Have you always worked with like a merit core or like girls who code or black girls who code type efforts who like kind of do this and maybe build that off or build a, a partnership in that sense and maybe the success oh. or unsuccesses. Oh, yes. Our yeah, studio, MPL, has uh, partnerships with Girls Who Code and other um, STEM programs uh, around the city. Okay. Richard, sir. Yeah, similarly, we, we've partnered with organizations that employ volunteers, um, but it's it's always been sort of finite, right? There's a program right. you've got $25,000 and you're going to do this in this fiscal year and you're going to check the box. And you're going to say, oh, you train 2,500 people or whatever. You know, you need something that just becomes more of your library program also with, yep. you know, with better outcomes measurements, too. Uh, and yeah. so it's, it's a, a more um, basically more muscle behind behind the effort is, is what's required. Yep, for sure. Uh, Lisa. One of our uh, most poster child towns um, for the change that library uh, that library growth made for economic development in Maine is Millinocket. This is a town that was stamped dead when the mills were shut down. And uh, one of the strongest supporters for getting that library back up and going was a person who had a business there in Millinocket. And I want to say it was around design and architecture. And this required moving big files up, not just down. And he told me that he actually had to put his files on a hard drive, put the hard drive on a bus, and send it up to Presque Isle to the closest place that had enough bandwidth to upload his files um, before the library came and was able to start really bringing some serious upload speed in. Um, whatever digital uh, initiatives we're going to do, I really think you need to focus on the upload speed. Um, we can consume and consume, download probably with, with lower bandwidth, but that's not really community economic and workforce development. That kicks in when people are able to start moving things up. Um, if we could do something here in Maine that would be quick and easy, I'd like to be able to have repeaters off of our building. Mm -hmm. I would market it in Maine as repeat after me or something, I don't know. But just to be able to get those high speeds out there. Um, there are people who, you know, Richard made the, the comment about cat videos, but there's actually a lot of people, my, one of my kids does this, who actually make their living off of YouTube <laughs> and Twitch and things like that. And that requires good streaming speed, good upload speed. Mm -hmm. And that's income coming into their zip code that wasn't already circulating around there. So that's pretty important. I'd like to see our libraries be able to focus uh, our collective buying power on electronic resources. If we're gonna be looking at another shutdown, physical books suddenly were something that couldn't circulate quite so much. Um, mm -hmm. Learning courses, you know, credentialing courses, things like that, and not just the sit and get, you know, where you watch a video and there I learned something, but something to way where people can be asking questions. It's been painful watching some of my colleagues have to try to do their work. We meet through Zoom or whatever, but they're also having to share their bandwidth with their kids who are having to do their schoolwork at the same time on that same bandwidth or in with a spouse who is also having to do work on it. And you really see the degradation of the connectivity and the signal over that. 
Um, so I'd like to be able to see us focus more on the materials that people need to do their workforce development, to do their learning, to do their work. Um, when I was director in Caribou, I had a gentleman come up as we were closing at the end of the day. He comes in every day, brought his laptop, brought his work with him. And because we had boosted our symmetrical speed in that library, he came over and said, I want to shake your hand. I can't get this kind of speed at home. I could not do my work if I didn't have this place to come into and do this. Um, and that really just powered home the fact that there are a lot of people who aren't working in offices. We like to say in Maine, you know, that you should be able to work where you live and not have to live where you work. And that's something that I guess I would just like to see. You know, we we have we have those good connectivities in our libraries. To what point can we be allowed to build out on that so that we're not shifting money over to that and instead we can focus on what the actual materials are that people need? Thank you. That's helpful. Misty, please. Um, for me, it's not necessarily about more funding. I would just like to um, better utilize the funding that we have. Um, mm -hmm. And if we are able to um, take advantage of the E-rate funding, I would like to be able to um, allow that funding to be used off-site and possibly the entire cost of the I mean, and I feel like that would be more beneficial than having to do the um, negotiations and, you know, we would be able to use these these funds off-site because, like previously mentioned, the library is outside of the library walls. We are not mm -hmm. constrained to these four walls of the building, and right. libraries have gotten past that so much that our funding does not need to be structured just and limited just to the the building um, we do so many for like activities outside of our walls and specifically with our I mean during this during COVID our library buildings were shut and we still provided right. services um, this shows if nothing else that we we need to be able to to go out into the communities and we need the funding to be able to do this um, my other side of this is economic development. That's one program that I have over the years that I've really seen um, how we as libraries, um, we need to pour into the economic development and give back to our businesses because, I mean, people move to, I know for our library specifically, we rely on property taxes. People are not going to move here if they have nothing to, to do. Um, we need right. to pour back into these building or these businesses and really build them back up because they have brought people here, um, and we are nothing without them either. So um, we partnered with the, with Grow with Google like last year, and um, of course that was a, a huge thing. But we also have partnered with our chambers of commerce and economic development across the state. Um, and I think like getting aside, getting away from maybe just story time, quit learning about yeah. story time so much and <laughs> really put love story time. businesses. So, uh, Missy, uh, uh, before I get to Nicole, I want to touch on one thing. You talked about like leveraging like current funding, like particularly E-rate uh, and maybe you have a quick reaction. Is, uh, you know, I've heard some libraries do this well and some others don't, but like putting together like E-rate IMLS funding to like, that, like expand pieces, is that happening, do you think, on the ground? Or are people just don't know what's out there? Is too much asymmetry of information? We, honestly, we would not be able to apply for E-rate funding if we did not have the Arkansas State Library to help us and to mm -hmm. guide us, okay. to fill out the paperwork and to help us. And that is for seven libraries, again, within our region. Um, and we are the oldest regional library in, our, in the state of Arkansas. And without the state library helping us, we wouldn't get state funding. And, or we wouldn't get the E-rate funding. And so I think about that, like, it, it is solely dependent upon somebody else helping us get this funding. It's just too complicated? It's so complicated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so complicated. Nicole, please, give your top two solutions here. Sure. Um, well, one thing to, to kind of, it's sort of related to E-rate and libraries trying to figure out 
what else can I do? And that's really uh, such a great part about libraries is um, that they are just devoted to their public and to their communities and, you know, want to do the absolute most. Um, we've had libraries in Globe, Arizona turn on a dime once the library building had to shut down. It became a, a school meal distribution center right away. Um, we had other libraries know that the public relies on computers and when they had to shut the mm -hmm. public down or their public access computers down, they found a way to get those computers one-on-one -on -one to people in the parking lot, cleaning everything down, making sure people oh. still had those access. Uh, that access. Oh. So the most important resource of libraries is the librarians and the staff. Mm -hmm. They are the reason why anything gets off the ground in the, in the first place. Um, so we really have to be able to support them and um, their enthusiasm. Uh, we know E-rate funding is absolutely critical for getting broadband infrastructure there, but um, especially in the pandemic, I'm seeing more and more libraries excited about what does a community network look like? How can I expand the signal even further? And trying to keep up with the FCC guidance on what is and isn't allowed, trying to maintain the momentum and the enthusiasm when the E-rate cycle is so long um, and mm -hmm. isn't really great at proactive uh, solutions or just getting a booster, um, we really need some of those negotiations. And at the same time, when I talk with tribal communities, knowing that um, they would have access to uh, the spectrum that's over their tribal land so that they can make mm -hmm. their own informed decisions and control um, the airwaves that are on the tribal lands is really critical too. Um, and we would welcome partnerships to be able to support those efforts that are made, um, those decisions made by the tribes. Um, I also think a lot about um, libraries' role in broadband adoption, and this is beyond free Wi-Fi access. We are starting a pilot project called the Arizona Libraries Technology Access Phone Line, and this is a network of five librarians from throughout the state um, who I've hired on to provide phone-based tech support. Um, so mm, this isn't sure. really, tech, tech support is really the carrot, um, but it's actually a broadband adoption service. So these five staff members are also uh, trained in where the discount internet offers are locally, where free Wi-Fi hotspots are, um, and where people can go to get uh, cheaper computers, right, or, or discount offers and right. cheap computers. So we know that uh, in-person community computer classes aren't happening. And so as that's moving more to online, people really need that one-on-one -on -one assistance. And we're really seeing that as the value. So we have people calling in to, uh, we have a 91-year-old woman who calls in repeatedly to get help with uh, sending text messages. We also have people asking how to do things on, with music editing software so they can mm -hmm. create art. And we have people calling in asking, hey, where's the free Wi-Fi in Bisbee, Arizona? Yeah. So these library staffs are really um, kind of expanding their, their own role and are becoming digital inclusion champions locally as well. Um, and this, this model is it's based on the National Digital Inclusion Alliance's digital navigators model, um, which is really just how are we getting people support one-on-one -on -one to be true adopters of internet, but to feel like they have the skills yep. as well as the affordable service and devices that meet those needs. It's just key from all the conversation that libraries and library staffs are just magicians. They make things happen no matter what, which is fantastic. Uh, Marika, please. Absolutely. Right. Um, that's, that's really exciting to hear about that because one of the things that we talk a lot about in, at, at ALA um, at the national level is kind of what are libraries seeing now with the pandemic in terms of programs that, that have had to pivot to virtual and how do you provide the access to the people who came to the library and no longer can um, and then how do you help people with digital skills and the adoption pieces virtually and Nicole part you partly answered that but I'm curious if other of the um, participants have any ideas about shifting to virtual and and maybe as we're building on that conversation what programs do you think might stick um, even as libraries are safely reopening depending on their local circumstances Does anybody want to jump I, on I, that yeah I'll, I'll I'll jump this is rich I'll jump in real real quick uh, 
to say a couple of things. So um, when we closed back in mid-March and went to this sort of virtual digital posture, um, you know, at the highest level, it was a great news story. Um, the use of the library was really robust. Circulation of library materials, um, you know, downloads, video streams, all this stuff was really great. Um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of individual uses. But then you begin to unpack the data and you sit down with your data analyst and they show that the discrepancy between, um, again, incomes of uh, high needs income, I'm sorry, high need populations or populations that are underserved, the use was, was much less, much, much less by a factor of 10, 15, 20 times sometimes. So all the use was just, just sort of being gobbled up by um, by uh, by communities that that probably don't need it as much as, as others, but but clearly the libraries have a um, a problem getting the word out, or we're not delivering the right content, or or there are other factors at play. So um, so the one bit of caution I give lots of people as they move to digital is that you are leaving more people behind when you go to digital now than you would be. Um, uh, than, than we are otherwise when our buildings are open. It, it's a massive, massive uh, gap. It's a really good point. I agree. Um, I, of course, when when our building shut down on March the 13th, um, March the 16th, we um, we did switch to an, an online virtual programming, um, but that was more for staff morale almost. Um, it, it really was. We, we switched to story times and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. But we have, especially in the past month, um, really gone back to using the phone, um, really calling and getting engaged with our customer base because a lot of them are, um, are at home. They do not have access to the internet. They were not on social media to begin with. Um, and if you didn't have a, search, a social media presence to begin with, um, there was no, you can't just build one um, automatically. You know, it, it was really was kind of, um, it was one of those things that it was either in place or it wasn't. Um, however, things that have worked very well for us online, we book, like the book clubs, um, but if you think about it, those are very intimate as it is. So those are things that people, if they are engaging through Zoom or something like that, that was an intimate conversation between people anyway. So um, we are doing something for our regional system um, in the month of August that we're doing lawyer in the library. So that is another thing that um, we've kind of switched over to more adult programming as opposed to trying to get the kids. Um, and But now a lot of our libraries are opening back up to the public just on a, on a limited basis. And so people who need that face-to-face -face contact, they're ready to see that anyway. They're going to come in to get an item, um, you know, with the protocols in place. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, some of what Misty is saying certainly resonates in Maine as well. A lot of my, especially coastal, uh, rural libraries, in order to stay in touch with their patrons, because they really are a lifeline in so many ways, just beyond acquisitions of materials, went back to just calling patrons and checking in on them, because they have no internet or computer at home. Um, if they needed to do anything like that, they would come to the library. Maine's been very lucky um, well, not lucky, We've, it's been proactive, um, and that our community uh, transmission rates have been very low for COVID and has been kind of mm -hmm. showing it down with trends. So some of the small rural libraries have cautiously started to reopen because that's really the only way a lot of people in those areas were going to be able to access the things that they needed to. Um, we also did a grow with Google um, that we were starting to launch last fall. And it was interesting, by the time they came to Maine, I asked them how they were advertising this program in rural states. And the girl that I asked said, well, 
she said at first we were doing like Facebook posts and stuff, you know, and I said, how's that working out for you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not too good. Uh, rural states, people don't have access to that. She said they had to go back to radio and newspaper to get the word out. That's how people would find out and be able to come. So that's certainly very telling as to how you're going to do your programs. Our libraries um, were able to, through the state library, get access to several Zoom accounts. About half of our libraries are 501c3s that have a governing board or some variation thereof. And this allowed their boards to be able to continue meeting and conduct business um, without having to come together. But again, if you are someplace where you don't have that connectivity, you right. know, that's not going to work out so well. I do have some good data sets that I will email later on, but one number I wanted okay. to throw out um, is of our 256 public libraries, 107 of them are only accurately able to report their wireless usage for the last year. Mm-hmm. So we only count those numbers because bad data is worse than no data. And just of those 107 libraries, there were over 962,000 wireless sessions in Maine. So this is all really helpful. And I have just so many more questions that I would love to dive into, but we're, we're running out of time here and, and Rudy's going to cut me off. So a uh, real quick lightning round. What would be all of your final takeaways for us as we've been trying to make recommendations to the FCC and their bully pulpit, either actions uh, that you all would like to see take uh, from this body or from the FCC? Just uh, one last takeaway from your point of view. Uh, and I'll start with Nicole and Mary, and then we'll, we'll go around, please. Um, you know, as I said previously, the, the best resource in libraries is the library staff. Um, and I'd really like to see more investment in library staff's uh, well-being and their technical skills as well, um, so that they're able to kind of be that model and be that, that anchor for the community locally. Um, what we see at the state is that um, libraries are really empowered when they're um, able to provide local solutions to issues. And so statewide measures are sometimes difficult to implement, as I, as I mentioned. Um, you know, a subgrant for hotspots will only work in one area, but it's not a, a perfect solution for other areas. Yeah. So really uh, involving libraries in that conversation is, um, is really critical. Thank you. Marian, please. I uh, agree with everything Nicole just said. Um, I think also to provide that support to library staff and to sustain and expand on our digital literacy programming, um, we need permanent funding sources so mm. that we're always running around trying to find funding to do this project or that project. Um, it would be really great if uh, we could take away that time we spend doing that and put it on our program. Thank you. Richard, do you have a reaction to final takeaway? Um, you know, I think what's been said is great. Um, you know, I think that that given the opportunity to speak to someone at the SEC or elsewhere is just underscoring this idea that broadband really is a basic human right at this point. You know, we are at a time where it is it is like running water or or electricity, and it's something that cannot be. Um, uh, offered uh, arbitrarily to those who have means versus those who don't, whether rural or urban, it doesn't matter. I think our jobs as librarians becomes that much easier once the access is facilitated. I think when we're put in the position of trying to be internet service providers by providing hotspots or something else, you know, yeah. we're really out of our lane and, you know, we're not really working at our best potential. So yeah. um, let's get people access and let's uh, let uh, library staff do the uh, do the training and, uh, and the education as I think we do really well. It's a really, really good piece. Thank you. Uh, Missy? I, I always challenge people to put themselves um, into our situations, into our shoes. Um, what would you do with 25 meg? Like, what would you do with the, like, with the standards that we have been given? Mm -hmm. And is that okay for your options? Like, if that is not okay for you to do the day-to-day work that you would do, then it's not okay for us. Um, It's not okay for a library. It's substandard. 
Um, and I like to put that out um, because a lot of times we wouldn't pay for services like that because we expect more. So, right. you know, I try to I try to challenge people to put their, um, you know, put themselves into our shoes and and walk in them for a little bit and to see what it's like um, working with no no um, resources. Very good point. Aaron, could I add one last point? Please. I think yes. that uh, what I would say to the SPC also is that um, broadband needs to be affordable for everyone. I know that there are low-cost plans available for those who are um, who meet the eligibility criteria, but I know an awful lot of working families who mm -hmm. don't qualify for assistance, so they're not eligible for low-cost broadband, but their income is not high enough that they can afford right. uh, broadband access. There's, there's just people in the middle here that are being left yep. out, too. Yep. yep, that's happening in a lot of things right now, especially right now, exacerbated by COVID, so thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Lisa and then Nicole will close this out. Or I guess Nicole, you're sorry. Lisa, please close this out. Uh, my biggest thing is just we're so thankful for the speed that we do have coming to our libraries. We want everybody mm -hmm. to be able to enjoy that. And so focus on upload speeds, not just download, and give us as much latitude to build on what we already have as possible. Uh, Richard and Nicole both made excellent points in that, you know, we would like to focus what funding we do get, whether it's through grants or or municipalities or whatever, on the people and the programs that are in our lane. Richard said that very well. Um, and so we're not having to spend all, spend that money on Band-Aid solutions for just getting mm -hmm. the basic connectivity out there because that doesn't even begin the work of, you know, digital literacy. So um, put, put the infrastructure there and let us, let us do what we can, um, even if it's just for now building out on what we know we already have. Um, and there is a uh, question that I got from Cindy in the chat. And I don't know yep. if you would yes. or I respond to it in please, the chat or please, respond please. to it here. And then I'll, yep. No, no, respond to it right now for everyone. Uh, I can read the, the question out loud so everyone has context. So um, Cindy asked her questions around marketing and outreach practices, particularly for the Latino community and communities who may be more Spanish dominant, Spanish speaking dominant. So I'll answer that for that question in Maine. Um, we have partnered with a lot of different agencies, again, through another Lumina Foundation-funded uh, mm -hmm. initiative called uh, Maine Spark. And it's the anywhere from 50 to 65% credentialing by 2025. I think every state has seen some iteration of that. And that has included having navigators and first point of contact for yeah. you know what we classify as new Mainers or um, just reaching out to communities that are either coming like from Somalia or are already like people of color or, you know, in our cases, a couple of the tribes too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, definitely having some librarians in place who can speak to this community has been a huge help. That's work we're doing on our end to diversify uh, the profession itself. But um, also knowing that libraries are a first point of contact, um, we've been partnering across different agencies so that, you know, when they come in, they're getting some help right away to say, I don't even know where to start. And so even if the librarian themselves cannot do it, if we have another agency that comes in that works uh, with new Mainers or with migratory populations or anything like that, um, they're able to speak to that and help them. And that's not one more thing the librarian is sitting there going, Oh my God, my annual reports due. I got to fill out my e-rate paperwork. Yeah. You know, I've yeah. got a patron throwing a chair, et cetera. So that's that's how we make that work. Well, uh, before I pass this on to Rudy, I wanted to say thank you all. This has been a very uh, robust and, and, and interesting conversation. I have so many more, uh, but th this is a, a great foundational start. Uh, and thank you, Marika, for all of your insight and help putting this together. You're uh, they're critical in getting this off the ground. So thank you. And uh, Rudy, our esteemed leader, please uh, take it away here. Well, actually, thank you very much. So this has been an incredibly enriching this discussion. Uh, exactly what we ex uh, ex expected, a lot of great ideas. 
Uh, I see that we're at time. Um, there are a lot of questions. I have at least like four or five questions I, I would love to ask. Um, but in order for us to do something remarkable, and that is uh, to stay on schedule, um, I will um, you know, suspend with any further uh, you know, questions. But just to thank this entire group for such a really um, you know, weighty discussion, a very meaningful discussion spanning a host of areas uh, that we will have to consider and see how that fits into our framework uh, as, as far as you know, our mission to deliver um, you know, recommendations, insights, and observations to the FCC. So thank you very much. What we do encourage you, because you all reference a lot of great things, to the extent you can follow up with some information, uh, additional information on many of the programs that you've mentioned, uh, we would love to receive those so we can ultimately you know, consider that and to include it in our uh, report itself. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. So for now, we're thank you all. on a break for the next, uh, uh, I guess, what, 10, 15 minutes till, uh, till 11.50. Operator? Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back at 11.50 a.m. Uh, welcome back. My name is Laura Barakal, and I am a member of the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group and co-chair of the Digital Inclusion Subgroup. I'll be moderating today's discussion with my fellow DEI Working Group colleague, Felicia West. Before we move in to introduce our distinguished speakers, I'd like to, sh to take a moment to set the framework for today's discussion on libraries and community partnerships. During our earlier session, we heard from local libraries and state library associations regarding their thoughts and perspectives on ways to foster greater digital inclusion within underserved communities. What we learned is when deep, the million dollar question is, what are the actual causes for today's digital divide? This is where the critically important conversation around digital inclusion and equity come in. So for the purposes of our conversation today, we will focus on the role uh, that community and public private partnerships play in advancing the work of libraries, particularly as it relates to broadband adoption and digital literacy training. So our conversation will essentially cover three key areas. Uh, they include one, community partnerships as drivers of digital inclusion, two, challenges to implementing growing and scaling programs, especially during a pandemic, and three, capacity building and ensuring that libraries and community organizations have tools and resources necessary to effectively develop and implement, and implement partnership programs. So with that said, I'm going to hand it off to Felicia West to introduce herself as well as today's distinguished panel. Alicia? Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure uh, to facilitate this conversation today. I am Felicia West. I am Senior Policy Advisor at the Public Service Commission of the District of Columbia. I'm also a DEI Working Group member. Uh, we're going to get right into our discussion. As Laura just highlighted, we're here today to talk about libraries and public-private partnerships. Uh, one of the things that I want to begin as we lay the foundation, I want to say that we're going to start off with a kickoff question. And as we've already discussed, we have a certain order and we will allow our panelists to respond. And we would go in the order of Bro Broderick, Cindy, Jillian, Emily, Antonio, and Catherine. The first kickoff question, just to give a little bit about or give information about what you do, can each panelist give us an idea of what your organization is and mission and what some of the core services that you offer, as well as uh, your groups that you offer those services to? Roderick? Yeah, thank you, Felicia. Thank you, uh, Laura, as well. And it's great to be part of this discussion. I, I look forward to a very uh, lively and informative conversation. I look forward to learning from the other panelists, certainly, as well. So I'm here in my capacity as the chairman of the My Brother's Keeper uh, Alliance. Uh, 
Um, in the Obama administration, I served the last three years uh, as President Obama's cabinet secretary. And if I didn't already have enough to do, I also chaired the My Brother's Keeper Task Force, which was created in February 2014 by President Obama, largely um, out of uh, his deep concerns uh, about what was happening to boys and young men of color, especially, um, and in the wake of the Trayvon Martin um, uh, tragedy as well. So uh, for the last three years of the administration, uh, we got my brother's keeper, uh, stood up with a full government approach, a data-driven driven approach, really looking at the disparities uh, that begin so early in life not just for boys and young men of color, but girls and young women of color, and really a lot of kids in this country who are disadvantaged. And uh, by looking at where the disparities exist, we also could look at, you know, what kind of um, kind of programs were effectively making a difference and what sort of programs could be scaled. Um, and, and also to look at what the private sector could do working along with government. So we spent a good three years on that, that work came up with all sorts of recommendations. A lot of those recommendations, particularly about solutions, had to do with uh, digital inclusion issues, realizing that the gaps were only going to continue, especially around education and employment and training uh, and just a view of the world, that those would only get worse if we didn't address digital divide and digital inclusion issues as well. So that was a big part of the work that, that we did. Um, while we were doing our work in the White House, there was also a parallel organization that was done that was started in the private sector by a number of business leaders and foundation leaders, and that was called the My Brother's Keeper Alliance. We had the task force in the White House, the Alliance outside. Um, the Alliance, especially though, worked with the for-profit and business sectors to uh, to stand up programs and to have all sorts of uh, both financial contributions, but also in kind in kind contributions made. Uh, again, to address these disparities. One that directly relates then to what we're talking about uh, today was uh, a commitment made by, by Sprint back in 2016 through the One Million Project to align and partner with MBK communities across the United States to provide uh, a million uh, devices and, uh, and also the services in order to connect uh, young people in MBK communities across the country um, through the use of, you know, being able to, to take advantage of dig digital opportunities. Um, that program involved a five-year commitment. Uh, it continues through 2022. Uh, there are 15 uh, communities across the state that uh, the United States that have been very much involved in the work. Uh, we look forward though to certainly um, other uh, companies being involved in making sure that both the devices and the services get out there and that we can expand even more broadly Notwithstanding the fact that, of course, Sprint and T-Mobile merged, and now there's a new T-Mobile, and we look forward to those conversations. Let me just sum it up with this. We know it is critical that communities of color, especially young people of color at all ages, have access not just to a device, but to a very, uh, you know, very, very strong device with great connectivity to make sure that they can compete both in terms of education, but also in employment-related opportunities as well. So. That's who I am. Sorry for that, for that long answer to your question, but I figured I'd introduce myself through that as well. So thank you, Felicia. Thank you, Broderick. Uh, Cindy, if you would, uh, it's great to hear the work that MBK is doing. Cindy, if you would, uh, when you give some idea of the services that you're offering and kind of highlight some of the digital inclusion programs that you offer. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Cindy Landrum. I am the Deputy Director for the Office of Library Services at the Institute of Museum and Library Services, also known as IMLS, and you may have heard a little bit about us in the previous panel. Uh, we are the primary source of federal funding for our nation's museums and libraries, and we also play an important role in research and policy development. Um, we are a funding agency, so we don't necessarily have direct-to-user programs. Um, though, as you heard in the previous panel, we do have some funding streams that support museums and libraries, in this case libraries specifically, around uh, digital inclusion activities and work. Um, we heard a little bit about our grants to state 
program which supports our state library administrative agencies in their work in their states around digital inclusion. And we also have a portfolio of discretionary grants that support digital inclusion. Um, that encompasses a wide variety of work that's broadband and connectivity focused all the way to digital skill building, capacity building for librarians and library staff to support digital inclusion in their community and offers and looks at a wide range of skills, everything from workforce development to language and cultural preservation as a, as a source of digital building, digital inclusion, and digital skills, um, and everything in between. Thank you. Great. Great, Cindy. It sounds like you and your role serve as a hub for all of our other libraries and institutions across the nation. Thank you for your okay. comments. Now we will go on to Jillian. Hey, thank you. Good morning or afternoon. I just Good want to morning. thank the working group for having me and uh, orchestrating this important conversation today. And to um, also just express my appreciation for all the other panelists. It's just really amazing work. So the After School Alliance is a national nonprofit organization with a mission to ensure an accessible, affordable after school program for every youth who wants one. And when I say after school programs, I really mean before school, after school, and summer. These are the programs you envision operating, for example, when the school day ends from 3 to 6 p.m. that offer student enrichment activities that support their school day academics. They might offer a snack or dinner and provide opportunities for physical activity and recreation as well. They're comprehensive programs. They operate in rural, urban, and suburban areas um, at schools, at boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, religious institutions, housing um, buildings, and also uh, private um, private centers and civic spaces, like parks and recreation centers, and at libraries. For working parents, they can really bring peace in mind that their children are engaged and supported in learning when school is out. And for students, they can be places to explore their passions and connect with caring adults, express their choice and voice, and become leaders, and really continue to develop the all-important skills of communication, collaboration, and creativity that will serve them well into their careers. At the After School Alliance, we don't run any after school programs directly, and we're not a membership organization. What we do do is work towards our mission by helping to coordinate after school programs as a field by providing research, advocacy, and communication for the field of after school across the country. We communicate with over 10,000 programs with national partners and providers and with statewide after school networks in all 50 states. In the research field, we conduct a survey about every five years, known as America After School PM, that really assesses the supply and demand of after school programs across the country. And so from this survey, we know that. About 10.2 million youth ages 5 to 18 are participating in these programs, but really there are still 19 million youth who would want to participate if a program were accessible and affordable to them. We also look closely at rural areas and areas of concentrated poverty where this need is further increased. We also provide uh, issue briefs and research for the field about how these programs intersect and influence key areas of interest, such as civic engagement, social emotional learning, science, technology, math, and engineering, student resilience through their trauma, literacy, workforce, and more. And we use this knowledge to communicate with the field and share best practice and examples, as well as to communicate with decision makers to ensure that wherever possible, these programs are available and affordable at the highest level of quality, which really means supporting and advocating for public funding and investment at the national, state, and local levels. We also coordinate nationwide events like Sleep on After School, where every fall we have programs all around the country open up their doors so that their community can see the exciting things taking place in after school. So we're really excited to be here today because there's a lot of overlap we share with both libraries and technology. And after school programs make great partners. I personally know how after schools and libraries can work together. I did work one uh, for a summer in an after school program located here in DC where I live at a housing provider at the and in their community center on site. And a staff member that I was working with at the camp suggested we um, plan to take the students to the local library. These are students in grades K through five, and the library was two or three blocks away. And in our first visit, we realized right away that many of the campers had never been, and so we were able to work with their parents and sign them up for their first library cards, and then able to make weekly visits. And in 2017, the After School Alliance partnered with the StarNet Project, the Science Technology Activities and Research Library Education Network, and with the American Library Association, study some of the connection between our fields and found that over 74% of after school programs have worked with their public library, including on summer reading, learning initiatives, uh, library visits to take out books or use the computer, STEM education, and professional development, among other areas. One of the restraints the study mentioned to working with libraries was physically getting the students on the site, uh, as well as after school programs lack of knowledge of the types of programs libraries were offering, um, which included oftentimes STEM and maker spaces. 
So we're working towards more communication in those areas. In addition to libraries and the, um, inside the digital space, after school programs also offer these types of activities themselves on site. They do STEM, maker spaces, digital literacy, workforce pathways. And for example, there are programs like Digital Harbor in Baltimore, Maryland, right nearby, which is a nonprofit after school program that really focuses on youth engagement with technology and has classes like sophomore development, cybersecurity, and IT, as well as offering certification in areas like the CompTIA IT Fundamentals Tech. So I'll stop there, but I'm looking forward to the conversation and I'm glad to be part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, thank you. It looks like uh, After School Alliance has developed a significant blueprint methodically to have a very, very far reach. And so thank you for your work and, your, and being here with us today. Now we're going to go on to Emily. Great. Thank you all so much for having me. Really excited to be here with all of you today. As Felicia mentioned, I, my name is Emily. I am the Senior Manager of Community Partnerships and Outreach here at Girls Who Code. Girls Who Code is an international nonprofit leading the movement to close the gender gap in technology and change the idea of what a programmer looks like and does. We specifically focus on inspiring, educating, and equipping girls with the soft skills and coding skills that they need to persist in the 21st century and to succeed and thrive. We specifically since uh, we were founded in 2012, have served over 300,000 girls through our programs, including our club program, our summer immersion program, and our college loop program, and over 500 million people through our campaigns, our advocacy work, and our 13 book New York Times bestselling series as well. Since uh, the past two years, we've also gone international. So in addition to the United States, we also serve programming in Canada, the UK, and India and are continuing to support and provide resources across the world as well. And everything that we do, we serve all girls, knowing that all girls have the um, abilities to succeed and use code to change the world in a variety of different ways. We specifically focus on girls as well who are underrepresented in computer science, are free and reduced lunch eligible, have little to no exposure in computer science and related fields, or identify as female regardless of gender assignment at birth. So we are definitely very inclusive environment as well. Our core programming across the board is definitely our club program. It's a completely free after school program that provides free curriculum, resources, training, and ongoing support to educators, librarians, and other nonprofit youth workers all across the country and internationally as well that focuses on third to fifth grade and sixth to 12th grade students as they learn to be brave and resilient as a use code to change the world. Overall, our programming does focus on three primary uh, aspects to our educational philosophy as well, including one, teaching more than code. So we definitely wanna give our young people the computational thinking skills to take that digital literacy to the next level and be able to access a lot of financial freedom that comes with coding skills. And so it focuses on the coding skills in addition to bravery, resilience, creativity, innovation, and a lot of other kind of project management and public speaking skills too, to help them persist. Secondly, we focus on sisterhood and that idea of community building, both bringing in more female representation and a lot of the programs and curriculum that we put out as well as forming a supportive network of peers and mentors to really make sure that they can persist as they get older. And lastly, making sure it is real world relevant and impactful always to one, keep the students engaged because we, want, we know that it is much more impactful as they ignite different passions for real world problems in the community that they want to solve to make it really connected and relevant to their lives and help them see too that they can do so many different things with their new skills. Across the board, it's everything that we offer is extremely flexible to provide resources and curriculum. Um, and so with our clubs program, which I'll talk a little bit about later as well, we definitely wanna provide as much support to librarians as much as possible, whether they are brand new to coding and have never done it before, or if they are um, extreme experts in the field as well. So as much as we can bring all the communities together and provide them the resources they need to succeed. That's really our goal overall. Wonderful, Emily, that's great to hear. That's part of the reason we're having this dialogue to see how we can identify community and public-private partnerships. Thank you. Uh, Antonio? Great, thanks so very much for having me. And thank you, Laura and Cindy for being my uh, technology Sherpas during this process. <laughs> 
So we are um, a focused, uh, the Hispanic Heritage Foundation focused on education, workforce, um, leadership, and culture. And the, I'll keep it to the programs that are related to technology and closing this digital gap that we actually call the tech equity gap, um, because that equity gap is getting bigger and bigger in education as, as well as workforce development, um, especially during this time. And Emily, thank you for the work that you do. It, it, it's great hearing about it from you and certainly a huge fan of everyone that's on this call. Broderick, I remember you from uh, from the Obama administration. So um, there's a program we, that we have called Code as a Second Language, which is um, at this point teaching over 100,000 kids how to code. Um, and also, we also have offshoot programs like Hacking a Career, where we actually work through current opportunities that exist during and post-COVID. We've added that element to it. And a sourcing program where we actually place. So we want to take it full, full circle. We want to start by introducing kids to coding and doing that kind of work. And then the middle of the pipeline where we're further advancing them and connecting them to others. And then actually putting them in a position um, to take jobs in that space. Um, we've also, on the technology side, it's been a bigger challenge that we'll get into later, um, but I can tell you that it's highlighted in terms of this, this gap in access to technology. So I appreciate everybody that's on here doing that kind of work and working with libraries and museums has helped to consolidate and, and those creative collaborations. I mean, Cindy just texted me and said, we need to get on the same page about some of these programs. Um, that's going to be critical. And um, we're working with Savio and others um, in terms of actual boot camps to make sure that we're funneling people that are having career changes right now in this crisis um, to get into those jobs. How do you pivot? It's almost like retrofitting your career. And if we're able to do that, uh, that's a very important thing, not just for the Latino community or underrepresented communities, but for the country, considering we're a minority majority. Um, the other part of this is, I, I think it's really important, is the other programs that we've had as we've gone 100% digital, like most, or, most organizations during this crisis, well, there's an educational crisis along with the financial and, 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 the, um, and the health crisis. And so by going digital, it puts a more of an emphasis in terms of people being able to have access. So what we've had to do is to follow the footprint of some of our partners that are providing uh, reduced access to um, to Wi-Fi or to technology or where they worked with a particular superintendent, um, we actually have to almost track that in order to execute our programming because if we're in Salinas Valley or Rio Grande Valley and four out of five Latinos um, aren't able to work from home, actually it's five out of six Latinos aren't able to work from home, then we have a bigger issue in terms of people homeschooling children without being prepared for it. I certainly haven't been. And then the mental health issues that arise when you have everyone crammed in and having all of these additional responsibilities. Um, and then, of course, the threat of getting COVID um, and, and, all, and, and getting thrown out of your home and being evicted and everything else. So it all ties together and is affecting education. Um, the other thing that we want to do, too, is to work with, we want to make sure we have more creators um, than consumer, that as much as consumers. And so we've been able to focus on that. And I'm glad to hear Emily talking about that too. So we've actually done research in terms of those impediments that I can talk about a little bit. Um, and also want to make sure that we have social, um, social activists, um, that we're having a social impact and access to technology is not only to be able to be educated and get a better job. It's also a way of working and building community and mobilizing community, especially during these times of social unrest. Um, so the research we're doing is very important in that aspect. And role model campaigns um, that I'm sure Emily and, and Cindy and others understand, and certainly Broderick in terms of his work that he's been able to do. So we work with celebrities in order to push forward that strong message. Uh, for instance, the latest one that we haven't announced yet, but it's with um, uh, Paulina Chavez from the show on Netflix, um, the wondrous, ex the expanding universe of um, of Ashley Garcia. So we're able to push her out there um, as a role model that's doing it on the national scale, along with real live scientists and and technology uh, girls and females. Um, but it's that relevance of having someone young that's a role model to somebody that's also young. So in all of our coding programs, we want to make sure that. Um, with all deference to wonderful, well-meaning retired engineers that are male and in their 60s, 
we want to make sure that it's a 19-year-old teaching a 14-year-old or, or, or a 24-year-old teaching a 17-year-old. Um, that comes from their own community as well. Uh, because in the Latino community, you want to, there's something about, there's some, there's an importance in being organic, that you're from the communities that you're serving. Um, so that's just a little background of what we're doing. And again, Laura, thank you for inviting me to be here. And it's, it's always comforting to be the weak link on a panel of, of this level. <laughs> I don't think you're weak. quite the weak link. <laughs> oh, I am. There's no weak, there's no, there's no weak links here. <laughs> I, I, I like the point you made about the tech equity gap uh, that speaks to access and ensuring, and as you mentioned, highlighted, as we move forward uh, in a more technological era, there will be more left behind and what are we doing to respond to that? So thank you for your comments. Last but not least, Catherine. Hi everyone, and thank you again to our organizers for this opportunity. Um, my name is Kat Trujillo. I'm the Director of Education and Deputy Director at Libraries Without Borders. Essentially, I wear many hats. Um, Libraries Without Borders is an international nonprofit, and our work is uh, focused on expanding access to information, education, and cultural engagement opportunities around the world, um, but specifically to people who are living in remote, isolated, um, or otherwise hard to reach and underserved communities. So we were founded in 2007, and the work we were doing then was very different from what we're doing now. Um, at that time, we were focusing on library systems and librarians themselves um, by providing professional development opportunities for them, as well as helping um, them expand their collections. But we were in Haiti when the earthquake struck, and um, that was an opportunity for us to reassess what our actual value was. Um, for the communities that the end users, the communities that we were really hoping to serve. Um, and at that point, we um, essentially rethought um, how we could provide services uh, to meet people where they are. We developed this uh, tool called the Idea Stuff, which I can talk about in uh, more detail later. Um, but it was the beginning of uh, it was the beginning of a trend uh, reflecting this idea of deconstructing the library and um, taking what is essential to the community directly. Um, so from refugee camps in Jordan uh, to demobilization zones in Colombia, um, from mobile home communities uh, to community gardens and from neighborhood laundromats, um, that's where we go. Um, our Wash and Learn initiative is actually um, one of the most, um, uh, it's a perfect example of just how we do that. Um, it's our flagship program. And um, it has been in effect for two years now. Um, basically, we partner with neighborhood li uh, laundromats um, and libraries, and we transform spaces within the laundromats into connectivity hubs, um, places where folks um, can uh, participate in digital literacy classes or ESL classes um, while they wait for their clothes to wash and dry. So that is one way that we try to make the most also of um, the time that people are spending um, that otherwise, you know, wouldn't be used uh, necessarily for digital literacy purposes. Um, and um, we are now obviously with COVID, um, our model is um, further evolving and we have further deconstructed um, our WALI uh, programming to provide connect ed tech kits, um, which are basically backpacks with a Wi-Fi hotspot, tablet, laptop, um, and curated educational resources that we deliver uh, directly to community, well, to families in particular, but also adults um, that need these devices and this access um, to live because everything is remote now, um, as this panel <laughs> is evidence of. Um, so that's it for now. I can go into more later, but um, that's it for me. One, wonderful, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, when you talk about libraries without borders, I think it's it speaks to another level of creativity of how we're trying to bridge the gap on digital divide. So thank you for those comments. Um, this is a good opening question uh, to give us the lay of the land of kind of the expertise that you all bring to the table. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host or my co-moderator, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. And thank you all for that perspective. I think it's great to kind of have that foundation and understanding of what you all do in your work. 
Um, so given that we started a little late, let's get right into it. Um, we walked through some of your signature programs and initiatives, the work that you're doing. I might just combine my first and second question together <laughs> in the interest of time. So my first question was really um, going to focus on what the uniqueness of your programs and initiatives are, but perhaps we can integrate that into the question um, that's more focused on how your partnership initi initiatives are able to successfully reach and make an impact on communities where others failed. So where there are gaps in communities in terms of how they're being served, how do your programs come in and kind of fill that gap? And I think with answering that, you, you kind of touch on the uniqueness of your program as well. Um, so maybe we can just kind of start with, uh, with Broderick, because I like the letter B, because it's my last name. <laughs> can you kick it off? <laughs> sure. Great. Thanks. Let me, well, you know, for, so I think what makes, you know, the My Brother's Keeper work uh, different certainly from all these uh, great initiatives and all that I'm learning from you all. And by the way, let's talk partnerships with MBK communities because many of them are probably are being served already by your programs, but perhaps we can better link the relationship between MBK because so much of our work is really focused on two principal things and supporting two principal areas. One is around, of course, um, violence reduction and what we can do to, to help lower, if not eliminate the violence that's going on in, in our communities. And second around mentoring. When you think now about mentoring, for example, what tremendous challenges our communities are now facing around mentoring programs, because for a lot of these young people, of course, the mentors have been a, are, and are a lifeline for them to give them something positive to point to, something to learn from. And yet now, because of this, this pandemic, of course, many of our young people in these MBK communities are so disconnected, of course, from, uh, from their mentors and, and vice versa, unless they have, of course, digital capabilities. Uh, and so we are putting as, uh, uh, an even greater emphasis on helping to identify resources and to scale programs that are addressing these things right away. These are urgent issues, of course, we know to make sure that uh, that we can address. Uh, I love this term, by the way, too, and, you know, um, tech equity. Uh, for decades, it's been the digital divide. I go back to my days in the Clinton White House, and we were talking digital divide, and people still have used that term, but I think there's so many equity-related issues, of course, that relate to, again, how sophisticated, whether the young people have devices at all, but then also how sophisticated those devices are and how connected they are and whether they even have strong broadband where they are. Uh, but our, our programs are really focused on what can we do to help at the community base level. Okay, thank you for that. Um, sure. And I like that term tech equity too, I'm a fan of it. Um, Emily, can we turn to you to give a range, you know, you have a range of programs with Girls Who Code. Um, can you provide some perspective in terms of how you're, you're filling the gaps within community? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in 2012, when we were founded by our CEO, Rashma Saujani, she really noticed kind of that that uh, divide as well and that overall gap in terms of our, our young girls and young women in computer science classes. But there's so much opportunity, I think, in this space that we really wanted to identify that inequity and then do something about it. Um, and overall, we did do research with Accenture, one of our corporate partners as well, where in 1995, you know, there were 37% of coders were women. Now it's only 24%, and if we do nothing, our findings show that it'll go down to 22% in 2025. So, you know, with 500,000 open computing jobs in the country today, but only 40,000 computer science graduates, and only 19% of our young college students majoring in computer science who are women, and only 2% women of color, that's really where we wanted to focus on our efforts and really show our young people too that there is opportunity out there, that there are people who look like them, who they can aspire, you know, and, and learn from, as well as, you know, pave the way too to get more women in the industry. And so for us, we do really be, have a big focus on, you know, you cannot be what you cannot see. And so how can we increase the, um, you know, level of female role models across a variety of different walks of life, variety of backgrounds, and variety of disciplines to know that, you know, there's 67% of jobs in non-tech traditional roles, 
right? So there's so many different things that they can do with it. And so across our programming too, um, in all the communities that we work with, urban, suburban, rural, all and all pockets of the country and beyond, um, you know, we really want to be able to expose our young people to these really fantastic women in the industry. And because our club as well, you know, definitely welcome students of all genders, um, in addition to being a girl supportive environment, I think it's really great too for all our young people to know that there are inspiring women in the industry, that they can do you know anything and accomplish quite a significant amount to positively impact the community. So I would say definitely the the perception piece, the activism, and overall our movement, even outside of our closed program, really focuses on changing those perceptions through a variety of different things. Thank you, Emily. What I'm seeing with a lot of these programs is, you know, despite the, the specific focus that they have, you know, whether it's mentoring, whether it's leadership development, there seems to always be an underlining focus on advancing digital skills, understanding that that's something incredibly important that all students and even, you know, adults need to be prepared to kind of get to work, go back to school, you know, they need to have those digital skills. Um, so piggybacking off of that question, Antonio, I'd like to just um, ask you if you could share some perspective related to some of the programs you have, because I know you have a code as a second language initiative um, that's kind of targeting students in a different way. So, so could you talk about that and how you see that specific program or, or others um, really filling um, gaps and making sure that you're serving where others maybe are not there and present? I think a lot of work is being done. It's just time to get creative with those collaborations and partnerships. Um, and also working backwards from what the needs of the communities are that are very specific. So for instance, we do code a second language um, in Spanish, where it's taught in Spanish, the curriculum's in Spanish, the leave behinds are in Spanish, um, and a lot of work with some of the youth that were uh, unaccompanied minors, as they were called several years ago, that were coming into this country and were learning English as a second language at the same time that we were teaching code as a second language. And when we did our surveys afterwards, they said it was easier to learn coding than it was to learn English because it's much more consistent. And so we want to make sure that we're teaching it in culturally relevant ways, not just because of the language and also with the parents there. I'll give you an example. We did something with my with one of our collabor collaborators in, Houston, in in Dallas, Texas, is Adan Gonzalez, and he has the Pueda Network, and we were able to work through him to teach about 300 kids how to code that were between K and K through 12. But their parents were there, and their parents, so we grilled, um, or his dad grilled, and so we had their parents, there was like another 150 parents there. Their parents realized that they started sitting down at the computer and learning the basics of coding as well. Because I can tell you that if, if your parents are smart enough to walk by a toaster that somebody discarded and is sitting on the side of the road and figure out how to make it work when they get home, they're going to be much more adept for, um, at, you know, as Emily was saying, computational thinking than I am going to be as a former journalism major that can't put anything together. So we want to also take advantage of those opportunities because I think that the real, one of the big issues right now is that people during and post COVID and already we were heading in that direction, but it's been accelerated, have to pivot to aspects of, their, of, of, of what's in their arsenal in terms of being able to enter the workforce or pivot in the workforce. And this is gonna be a key component of it, whether it's little kids or whether it's or their parents. What's interesting is that everyone learns at the same level. You don't have to have a different curriculum for somebody that's a beginner. Um, and, and that's a part of it that I think makes it. Um, and you also, we're very malleable with everything we do, Laura. So I think what also makes it unique is that nothing is set. We work off of an assessment in terms of that particular community, their, um, their experience, what their teachers said, what their parents say. And then we try to measure how it's impacted everything else, how it impacted their grades in their overall um, schoolwork. Uh, just from this part of it. And also sometimes when you're dealing with a particular group, how do you implement, how do you use coding as the, uh, uh, um, in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of the curriculum being um, uh, uh, video game based um, and, and other areas that you can actually do things that are very specific to how that 
that community of young people wants to receive the information instead of doing it like most educational systems that are going to try to jam it down your throat no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, so I think being malleable, um, being extremely flexible and working backwards from what the needs are of the communities in terms of what the curriculum you're putting forward is. And as Emily said, having somebody that's young that resembles them, teaching them is going to be critical um, so that it's not just a well-meaning person that is trying to um, work with them because there's that role model component. We did research with the Student Research Foundation and found that the confidence gap was bigger in this particular study of 16,000 uh, Gen Z students right now than the um, opportunity or the, or the education and all these other gaps. It was actually confidence, so, especially among young Latina girls. So how do you build that confidence? You want to make sure that they have somebody that they, as you said, see it, be it, um, as well as that are from their communities, because that's another aspect of this. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's a really, really great perspective. Um, so I, I want to move a little bit into kind of like the metrics and like what the data tells us about programs. Um, so my next question is going to be focused on that. Um, and then we'll move into kind of a, a conversation around challenges and barriers to program implementation and growth. Um, so question, my next question, what are some of your success metrics or case studies as it relates to advancing digital skills? For example, what does your program data show you? Um, who typically takes advantage of your programs and why? And Cindy, I'd like to start with you um, for a perspective from IMLS, um, just because I know you're not working necessarily directly with the beneficiary per se, but you're working with libraries and you're providing support um, to ensure that their programs are being managed properly and directed the way they should be. So if you could provide some perspective on, on the metrics piece, I think that would be really insightful. Sure. Um, so IMLS, what you may not be aware of is that IMLS does do uh, several annual surveys um, that look at, for example, public libraries nationally to look at the work that they're doing um, as well as our work with our partners. So um, one of the partners are state libraries and they do a survey about uh, the programs that they fund through our Grants to States program. And to that end, um, one of the things sort of connected to the previous question for IMLS is that, you know, our funding is very broad and it covers a lot of territory. So, for example, in our Grants to States program, um, we rely heavily on our state libraries who know their communities and they know what the needs are and are able to structure um, the use of our funding in a way that benefits those communities. So there is you know, obviously an emphasis on a lot of quantitative data around uh, our funding. And then there are some interesting use cases. Currently, one of the uh, projects uh, that IMLS is working with libraries on is something called Measures That Matter which is to really focus and target our metrics in a way that generates meaningful uh, data. Uh, and we're working with a number of uh, partner organizations, ALA, PLA, um, and so COSLA, a number of other associations. Um, for us, we also do look at, um, in our discretionary portfolio, our grantees are often, often developing their own evaluations that may measure both qualitative and quantitative. So we're doing use cases in some cases as, as well as uh, other forms of qualitative evaluation. And so it's sort of a mixed method approach to looking at the effectiveness of a program um, whether that is with our direct to direct to the public program or a lot of capacity building. So we work with libraries um, to develop the capacity of library staff to do digital inclusion work and to do training work. And so it's sort of a wide range of, of metrics and measures that we use to um, evaluate 
the success of the work that we fund. Thank you for that, Cindy. That's helpful. Um, I'd also like to turn to Jillian on this question. Are there specific metrics that After School Alliance applies in its program assessments that you'd like to share? Thank you. Actually, um, so for the After School Alliance, we um, don't operate any programs directly, but we have great examples like Emily and Nicole and um, Antonio that are doing exactly this type of work. Um, and so they are collecting these metrics and our, our job is really to make sure that people are aware of how impactful their programs are so that they continue to support them, so that all of the people who are waiting to get into their programs um, and would love to have access in their own communities have that access that they need. And so the most important metric that we um, establish is how many you know, students and families would love to have access to quality programs like theirs um, that don't currently, and that, and that number is quite large um, and continues to grow. And then um, we also you know, are able to collect information from programs in the field that do communicate with us and are able to give us information. And so for example, um, right now, obviously, we're, we're all struggling with the COVID pandemic and wondering how many students have uh, even that digital access that they need. And so we have programs like uh, After School Matters in Chicago is a great example of a high quality um, after school program that operates and helps teens in our community. And they were able to look at some data that found that, um, you know, two thirds of the teens that schools went virtual were accessing the internet slowly through their phone and they weren't even able to download documents or stream video. And so we take information like this and make sure that um, it's probably uh, aware and accessible to other people so that they can make decisions on these accounts. Uh, students would be able to go on Zoom calls, but only if these call their data. They were completing their schoolwork from cell phone and didn't have a keyboard to type with. Um, and so these are the kinds of um, pieces of information that uh, as a advocacy and research organization we're able to collect and disseminate so that we can uh, have conversations like these and figure out how to make sure that every student has the access and opportunity that they need. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to now uh, move it over, hand it off to Felicia. She's going to go into a deeper dive on the challenges piece. And um, thank you all for your comments on this portion of the conversation. Um, so Felicia, I'll hand it off to you to go through some of these additional questions we have. Thank you, Laura. Uh, sure. As Laura just mentioned, we want to, uh, part of our conversation today is to kind of give us an idea of some of the work you do, but also we want to know what those potential challenges and barriers are. And I want to start this question with Cindy. Uh, you, in your role, uh, you know the policy considerations behind how to make libraries effective, how to make them uh, vibrant in their community. How has COVID uh, challenged your work and how are you addressing those challenges? Um, so as my colleagues on the previous panel discussed the pivot that many libraries um, had to make due to COVID. Um, so IMLS did receive money in the CARES Act with a very clear uh, focus in the legislative language around digital inclusion. And of course, it was, we received $50 million and we were able to distribute $30 million through our Grants to States program to our state library administrative agencies uh, to work directly in their states. And then an additional remaining funds are, are part of a competitive grant program that is still in, the, in running currently. Um, what I can say is that it's not enough. <laughs> Um, the need is far greater than, I mean, we, I think we knew it was a great need. Um, this circumstance, the pandemic has really put in stark relief just how challenging this is for our library communities because, you know, I think uh, Rich talked about, you know, 20 years that he and I both have been in libraries um, the work of libraries, particularly around access, has been done in the library with computer labs and things of that nature. And, you know, we have had our foray into providing hotspots and devices with varying degrees of success. Um, but the pivot to digital um, has really, it has left many people out. Um, and it has really sort of highlighted the need for us to think creatively 
um, about how we address uh, connectivity, but also even when someone um, has access, uh, just the ability to navigate. You know, one of the things that we talk about at the agency is yes, digital skills, but also telehealth and health literacy and all of those things that you now need in this current pandemic to be able just to stay healthy, just to be able to connect with your children's educational opportunities and, and educators and, and even to participate in some of my colleagues on this panel, their program um, requires access and connectivity and then understanding of how to navigate the digital landscape. Wonderful. Uh, I heard on our previous panel, someone made the analogy between having access to technology is like having access to running water or electricity. In the digital age that we live in, we can see that that is more apparent day by day. And now that we're in this new normal, uh, we're in a pandemic and looking post-pandemic, things would certainly be different. Broderick, would you like to share about some of the challenges that MBK has been facing? Uh, certainly, um, you know, right away, um, I'd say by, you know, late March or early April, uh, we knew that uh, we needed to reach out to the MBK communities across the country, and we needed to use our digital capabilities in order to be a gathering place. So we had, uh, including with President Obama's participation in some of these, we had six town hall sessions where we brought together uh, activists, leaders of MBK communities across the country, but also a lot of the young people that these communities work with so they could hear from our leadership, hear from President Obama, hear from other folks, um, and to, to remind them that we care deeply about them, that the leaders in their communities care deeply about them, and that we would use the digital capabilities to the extent that we could to stay in touch with them. But that's where the challenge is as well, of course, because in so many of these communities, the gaps already existed and they've only gotten, only gotten wider because whether it's about access to education or whether it's just the isolation that, that we know about, uh, or whether it be food security concerns that people have or food access concerns, we know the gaps have gotten wider and they are more dangerous. Our perspective though, of course, fundamentally is how do we use the capabilities, how do we use digital access? Um, how do we make the case for greater digital access at a time when we know it's even more critical that we address these issues? And so we see it as, as an opportunity to make the case even more, but the challenges are greater. There's no question about it. The challenges are even greater and there's such a danger of leaving more and more of our young folks uh, behind. I agree with you. The education piece is a, is a huge issue. And uh, given the fact that most of our schools will be enrolling this fall, either in a hybrid or a virtual world, uh, it's more critical uh, for that to be used for our education. Jillian, you, you bring a unique perspective uh, from the school setting. Would you like to share how the Alliance is doing in, in meeting the challenges of COVID? Well, it's been um, obviously uh, a bit stressful for all of us. And um, one of the things um, that, like Broderick was saying, that has come out of it is a lot of innovation and increased communication. And so the silver lining is that a lot of different partners that formerly saw themselves as separate players, whether it's libraries, schools, uh, after school programs, um, are coming together around the same table, um, meal service providers, to say, what, what can we do right now? Because we know this is an all hands on deck type of situation. And so, um, some of the benefits that have come out of that have just been these conversations about building those connections between the family, uh, the school, the community, and community partners, and those resources, whether they're mental health resources or food resources or technology resources that every family needs. And so um, from the broader after school perspective, you know, we saw that a lot of programs were challenged initially, especially they're used to operating on site. And so um, initially there was a sense they would shut down, but we did a survey uh, about a month ago at the end of June and 75% were still operating in some capacity in low-income communities, making sure that um, they were connecting with families, making sure that the families had resources and meals um, and other um, 
priorities that they would need to continue moving forward. And so we're hoping to continue those conversations um, as how the schools are going to need um, safe spaces for students during those days when they're virtual and those days when they're hybrid and those spaces are going to need technology access. And there are already innovations we've seen like um, in California, there are some innovations on community hubs that are creating spaces that are outside of the schools where students will have digital access, uh, caring adults, um, the types of people they need. And again, in order to service this entire education community, it's really um, every single partner that needs to come together and have conversations about these, as well as, as others were saying, kind of the federal government and others recognizing the amount of investment that's really needed um, to serve these students well with the technology that they need and the resources that they need in this space. Thank you, Jillian. Antonio, you talked earlier about workforce development and uh, among other things, how uh, can you share specifically how your piece on workforce training is being impacted by COVID? I will, Felicia. I just want to just for a quick mention that there's a phenomenon called the summer slide that every summer for the two to two and a half months that kids are out of school, you have a, a drop off of 25, sometimes 30%, especially with minorities, um, in terms of what they learn during the academic year that they lose over the summer. That slide is now six months at least instead of two. So we have to look at how to make that up. So there, there's a different gap that we're dealing with that comes from this elongated period, especially hopefully things are gonna be better in the fall in terms of the how they're gonna handle things uh, digitally and, and or this amalgam of, of going into school a couple of days, this hybrid. Uh, but I know it didn't go well that in the spring um, because everyone in the world was unprepared for what was about to happen in all fairness to everyone involved. Um, but so that means essentially our kids haven't learned since February, all the way through September and beyond. So um, I just want to mention that as it, it makes all of us collectively have to work even harder to catch up um, beyond trying to move forward. In terms of the workforce development part, as much as it's a, you know, that this issue has become more difficult for obvious reasons. We used to work through the schools and even then it was a challenge to make sure they had adequate Wi-Fi. We used to bring hot, numerous hotspots. We used to do what Jillian was just talking about, where we'd have buses that were hooked up to Wi-Fi and then have people work around them. Um, we would try to work with local restaurants that had Wi-Fi to let kids come and work. So we got to have to get creative. Now they can't gather. So it's become even more difficult that you have to deal with individuals' homes. Um, and so the workforce development part um, starts at education. I mean, some would say that K through 12 is actually workforce development because you're trying to put them in a position for, for when they go, um, you know, if they go to college, even if, it's, if they go into the workforce, there are some really great careers you can have right from um, getting a GED. That's the beauty of technology. It's, 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 it, it almost levels the playing field in terms of your opportunities in some strange way. If you have um, an a, a equal a, a facility to playing video games, to building video games, to being in cybersecurity, there's, there's a beautiful line here beyond the traditional lines that we've had in the past. Well, that's even more difficult when we can't execute our programs. This program that we're doing with Savio is fantastic. If you have access to Wi-Fi at home and, and, and also to the right um, technology in terms of the right computer that you're able to do the programs that you're supposed to do. And let's not forget that I think it's now something like 85 to 90% of all jobs that are, are posted online. Um, and what, as we're doing more and more work in rural areas with the, with farming communities and, and their children or native communities, we talk about um, our minority communities. Boy, we need to talk more about our native communities and what's going on in terms of that equity issue. Um, so um, it's all become a bigger challenge, but with challenges comes more creativity. Um, with challenges comes more adaptability and changing course with how you, we even as an organization, I've been here almost 20 years and we've done things differently in this past six months than we've done over the 20 years. So there is an element of rethinking how you're doing things and figuring out better ways 
um, and more productive and efficient ways of doing things. But this is where we're going to count on Laura and her colleagues in the in the in the in the private sector, um, because I'm not kidding you. We actually follow where they have um, provide access and and less expensive access to technology as part of our strategy. Otherwise, we're dead in the water. Emily and Cindy and I, we can't do anything if we don't have those, 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 that footprint where we can follow it and know that we can at the very least have a fighting chance of having our communities connected. Um, but yes, this is impacting a lot of things, but I think it's also impacting our organizations to think differently, to be more creative, to be more impactful, and to leverage technology more, um, just to have to make sure that everyone's connected. Thank you, Antonio. The leveraging piece is huge. It's definitely huge. And I heard you say leveling the playing field. It's all about having and providing access for everyone. Uh, Emily and Catherine, you want to share some of your challenges in this COVID? Sure. Um, you know, I definitely resonate with what you're saying, Antonio and Jillian. I think this is a very unique opportunity to innovate our old systems to address that learning loss across the entire country. And I think you know, for our librarians too, we've specifically been thinking too about what are the types of resources, materials we can really adjust quite significantly in order to fill that need because we know that everyone is overwhelmed. Everyone's trying to make these pivots. And so how can we make that as smooth of a process as possible, um, you know, as we're pushing to be more innovative. And so definitely that's been a challenge for us. We have chatted with a lot of our community partners, our departments of education, school districts, library networks that we work with, and a lot of them are identifying the same thing. The question about digital access is a huge one and the hotspots, as you're all mentioning, and also thinking about equity. And I think this, because of the mental health pieces too, and a lot of the social movement through Black Lives Matter and a lot of really important things, there's a lot going on in the world. And so how can we give our young people and our educators and librarians tools to do something about it if they're feeling stuck and feeling like there's that helplessness in the world right now that it's really hard to address. And so for us as a, as a whole, we've been really working nonstop to really convert all of our materials to you know online um, right now for our clubs program in particular we've included a lot more virtual support capabilities best practices for supporting each community and encouraging them to also be really brave and resilient during this time to adjust whether they are taking a look at some of the digital access and saying okay if my uh, library patrons don't have access to the technology. How can I adjust it? Am I, you know, printing out some resources and they can still work on some computational thinking offline during this time so they're prepared and ready to go by the time that they're back and able to access things online. Or maybe if they have one computer, smaller hotspot bandwidth access in their home that they're sharing maybe with lots of other family members okay, well then if you can't meet regularly during a specific time, can you have a mix of asynchronous and synchronous lessons? Can you pre-record some of your sessions so that way the students can still see their faces and still get that emotional support and guidance, but maybe they're watching it at a later time after their parents and guardians have stopped working. Um, so there's different, I think, workarounds that we've really had to build in to support the communities. Um, and our goal really too is how can we adjust the training supports and everything so that way they could just pick it up and run with it. They don't have to think about anything else. There's a lot of challenges and pivots they're doing already so we can make a little bit easier. And you know, I think for us as a whole too, we're really thinking about our college students and having them kind of support the younger generation too, the K through 12. We have about 80,000 college age alumni now, um, majoring in computer science and related fields at 15 times the national average, our black and Latinx uh, alumni at 16 times the national average. So how can we use that momentum of folks who we've already supported and have them give back? So I definitely encourage a lot of uh, library communities too, to reach out to this community, find other volunteers, people who can support them, whether they're going virtual or just getting extra hands and extra help, but also giving the community a way for them to connect and come back to social isolation. I think that a lot of folks are fe uh, feeling during this time. So really resonating to, once again, Antonio, like bringing everybody together, it's the whole community um, and kind of this collective activism that we can really ignite to improve the lives of our young people. Thank you. Um, just to add to that, it, 
feels a bit strange to say this, but um, the pandemic has actually made it so that it's kind of libraries without borders time to shine. <laughs> um, we've <laughs> always had to, as a small scrappy organization, you know, we've always had to be creative um, about, you know, the channels that we use, uh, informal networks. Our distribution model by virtue of, you know, our size is invariably grassroots. Um, so whether it's, you know, sending text messages or having, you know, establishing um, a strong relationship with someone who's a, a leader in the community or somebody who's a connector, um, and then they text other people because folks don't have connectivity um, to let them know of the connect ed kids in, our, in, in this case. Um, or churches, or um, recently we distributed, I think, 22 of the connected touches at a community garden um, in Baltimore. And that's just an example of, you know, people need access to food and they need access to devices and, and the internet, and they can get it in one fell swoop. The community garden in that case is like our laundromat. Um, we've uh, worked with food banks uh, to add resources to their own distribution. And um, oddly enough, um, we're learning from our work in refugee camps where we use exactly what Emily was talking about, um, asynchronous and synchronous, a combination of the two um, to actually help people with certification programs. So that's something that's on the horizon for, um, for us here in the US um, because you know, drones can only go so far. Um, we want to make sure that people have devices like laptops where they can, for kids do their homework or for adults apply for um, unemployment benefits or for work or, you know, whatever it is that we do online, which is pretty much everything these days. And so we just, um, we're trying to also serve as a connector ourselves. Um, Baltimore City Public Schools actually reached out to us because as many of you mentioned, school um, may, has, may be reopening soon. And um, the city, um, the school, the public school system said that they actually don't really have an idea of how to get devices and hotspots um, to the families that need it most. They sent out a survey, they got a 40% response rate. And so they know there's a need, but they can't identify how to fill it. And this is where we come in because our informal networks have actually been incredibly successful at helping us identify where the need is um, and and getting um, these very devices and connectivity to the people who need it most. Thank you, Catherine. That's a very important point. The reality is, is that as we look at the data, there's a direct correlation between those who don't have access and the poverty level, meaning that typically those who are in lower income uh, brackets are the ones that are being left behind. So it's important, as you even mentioned about uh, interfacing some of the social services with the digital inclusion. Uh, thank you uh, to both of you. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to, in the interest of time, uh, go ahead and uh, hand it over to Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. This is this has been a great conversation. Um, I know we're we're kind of winding down now, so I wanted to make sure that we left time to talk through solutions and lessons learned. Um, we're also gonna be hearing from one of our fellow uh, DEI working group members, Cindy Benavides. So um, I will say that, you know, hearing all of you, I know these times have, have really been tough for a lot of organizations in terms of their ability to really find ways to, to continue pushing forward with their programs and serving communities. Um, I like, like Antonio, Hispanic Heritage Foundation, I do think that this is also an opportunity where, where there are some bright spots there are new opportunities for creativity and ingenuity, um, particularly as it relates to transitioning civil society back to work, students going back to school, as Catherine, you mentioned, and, and all the everyday, everyday things that we used to do before COVID kind of hit us, right? Um, so my next question is really more focused on capacity building. And Catherine, I'd like to, to continue with you on this question. Um, you know, what, based on your work with Libraries Without Borders, what are the opportunities for capacity building and ensuring that, that your partnerships with libraries as well as with community organizations continue to have the tools and resources to develop and implement programs that are successful? Thank you, Laura, for that question. Um, I think the, it really addresses, um, again, not to emphasize the small and scrappy bit, but how that's actually um, a benefit for Libraries Without Borders. Um, because we are small, we are able to take risks and 
um, fail without it having huge implications um, uh, for um, our, you know, we don't have investors, but also for um, foundations or other um, other uh, organizations that invest or that support our operations. Um, and so we're able to approach library systems that are much larger, um, for instance, the Enough Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, and say, hey, we want to try this partnership in a laundromat, or we want to try virtual story time with your librarians and our connected kids, um, the families who have them. Um, they don't have to make a, a large investment um, in try, trying out this arrangement. Um, because we lower the barriers, right, um, for library systems and other partners who are much larger and potentially more bureaucratic than we are. Um, and so we're able to provide an extension of those services um, to people directly in their homes. And it's an opportunity um, to try these new things that w might not otherwise um, get tested. Um, and then to develop a use case and see, is this worth putting more money, like um, spending more money on? Um, if so, then let's scale up. If not, what do we need to change? What can we improve? Um, so it's, a, it's a really an opportunity to help larger um, institutions and organizations uh, through their partnership with us try new things um, that they might not otherwise. Okay. Um, and maybe and maybe we make this question kind of a more free flowing question because it's really just about you know what are the opportunities for capacity capacity building. You know, where um, can organizations benefit? What are the things that can be done better that maybe are low hanging fruit? Um, you know, so I, I would encourage folks to chime in as well as they see fit. But, you know, Emily, I know you have a lot of programs as well and Broderick, so maybe you all can provide some perspective there as well. Absolutely. I think overall, even though there is so much challenge with you know, accessing, uh, you know, uh, digital access, and then also just kind of pivoting a lot of our programs. I do think there's so many really fantastic organizations like ours and like others who are, you know, putting together very kind of quick go and run with it resources that people can use. So it's just a matter of finding them, getting connected to them, and being able to get that support to move forward. And so in terms of kind of our capacity building that we're doing to, to support a lot of libraries is really helping them, you know, to really help our now, young people navigate this new normal for that job security and feature and more as we work with these libraries. And so for us overall, you know, I think as we, you know, create very clear meeting guides, we have over 120 plus hours of curriculum across a variety of skill levels, you know, with group builder, a community building activities, women in tech spotlights, um, summer speaker series, and a lot of virtual things that they can tap into, you know, I think that's definitely something that they can use. Also, what is continued engagement look like? So we do have student recruitment resources, but lots of tips and strategies to keep the young people engaged and participating overall. So I do think that'll definitely support them. Plus our alumni programming too, like specific job platforms to help our uh, college students go and move into these different roles. And I think uh, uh, libraries in particular can be really great connectors to make that happen as well. And so for them, they definitely, you know, should know that they're not alone, that there's definitely people out there to support them, resources that they can access. So they should, you know, sign up to different newsletters from STEM organizations in their state. Every, you know, there's so many STEM ecosystems they can tap into. And these newsletters can help them find those resources or tap into, you know, folks like, like us or, or follow and, and find ways to, you know, take this and then share it out with their community. We even had, you know, code at home resources, which are standalone activities online or unplugged that people can use. And so many organizations are creating things like this. So definitely tap in there. So that way they're not also getting burnt out so quickly, you know, I think as they're going through and doing the best that they can for the community too. And also knowing when to take a break, have some self-care so they can have more community care as well. I wanted to just uh, first refer back to something that's been emphasized. Antonio brought this up, uh, for example, uh, a few minutes ago around the idea of the summer slide. We know that is uh, that exists. Uh, there's enough data, sadly, to show the, that it exists and the impact of it. We also, though, now are faced with not just an education related summer slide, but also, of course, one around the mental health of these young folks. 
And related to that for me is, um, again, looking at what can be most helpful as we as we go forward, as we emerge from this pandemic, is, you know, for, for those young folks who do have, do have uh, access, who do have the tools, you worry a, a bit about them becoming isolated and they come out of this pandemic more isolated, more mm -hmm. sort of focused on a device as a way in which they engage with the world. Uh, so I think we need to be very, very uh, careful and measure the impact of the mental health crisis and the isolation that can bring as we try to bring young people together. Because on the other hand, we could certainly use digital capabilities in order to make sure that people are coming back together again. For example, mentoring programs, again, starting at, at libraries where they had had to cease as gathering places for a while. So I, I think we have to, you know, just look at both the opportunities, but also the costs of this period and what, you know, digital uh, um, equity um, has to say about both those uh, sides of the coin. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, so we, I, what I want to do, because we're kind of running low on time, I want to kick it off to Cindy Benavides, who's our uh, fellow working group member, to provide some perspective um, as CEO of the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, and also um, as our working group member. And then following her comments, we're just going to move into some Q&A from our committee members. Cindy, can I hand it off to you? Great. Thank you so much, Laura, and, and thank you so much, Felicia, for moderating this panel and to all the panelists. Thank you for all of your insights. Um, definitely agree in terms of the tech and digital equity gap of making sure that we have connectivity hubs, digital literacy, mentoring, addressing the gender gap, and obviously looking at how COVID-19 is impacting our various communities, especially as we see as communities of color. Um, one, the increase in the education gap, definitely already seen the summer slide. Um, at LULAC, we're about 91 years young, 91 years strong. We're a Latino civil rights organization, and we do a lot of different things. And, and one of those is not only addressing education, health, civil rights, political empowerment, but also technology. Um, and in that strand, we have something called our Empower Hispanic America with Technology Centers, which we actually created under President Clinton. So we've been doing this now for close to two decades um, and more than two decades, in fact, to make sure that we're addressing that gap in the Latino community. And what that is, is 68 technology centers around the country and specific Latino communities. Um, and we work with everything around digital literacy to uh, making sure that we have workforce development, mentoring, and leadership development. And, you know, one of the proud partnerships that we have is actually with the local library in San Juan Bautista um, and partnering not only with the library, but also with the mayor, Mayor Mary Vasquez Edge, to make sure that we uplift this program in the school system and in the entire community. And we're very proud, it's a rural community. So obviously, you know, making sure we are addressing the gaps in the rural community is really, really important. We have similar programs and technology centers across the country uh, in different cities, but also in rural areas where our communities are impacted. Um, I will tell you that we also have some things called Tecnolochicas, and that's specifically for our Latina middle school age youngsters. And what we have learned through Tecnolochicas is obviously making sure that we're more than 2 to 3% of Latinas in this specific field. But what we're learning is that we have to start um, making sure we're investing in our youngsters at a very early age, starting even before middle school. And what we're, correlation that we're finding as we look at the data and assessments is that there is an improved confidence in our Latina middle school age girls as they're being exposed to the technology field. And so, you know, we are continuing to invest in that specific section. And then we also have something called the Latino Tech Summit, which is really for young professionals, individuals who are in college to make sure that we are connecting, that we are mentoring uh, individuals who choose to go into these fields, and that they are also connecting with the different corporations who uh, have careers in the various fields that exist. And one thing that we're learning is really that, that mentorship or sponsorship component of making sure that 
as communities of color going into the specific field that they have the sponsorship of individuals that can really help them in terms of understanding workplace culture um, and train them around those things that are not innately trained or exposed to. Um, I did want to just acknowledge the great work of my brother in La Lucha, Tony Tijerino. Um, we do so much work. Broderick, I already sent you a LinkedIn request. I'm hoping to connect with you on my brother's keepers. And um, Cindy, Emily, um, Kathleen, and Jillian, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I did want to end it by saying that we do have a financial relief program, um, and that also is paired with uh, technology access, which includes computers and hotspots. And what we're finding in our community is that as Latino communities, and particularly the undocumented community, is self-evicting because the moratoriums for rent are currently up. What they're looking at is this location. So right now their priority is not even technology access, their priority is just surviving. And so as we look at vulnerable communities, we have to really keep in mind the realities that they're leave, living under COVID-19. And again, thank you for the panelists. And before concluding, Laura, I did want to acknowledge that today marks the one year anniversary of the shooting in El Paso, uh, which is something that disparately impacted the Latino community. And so I did want to make sure that we did acknowledge that today is a one year anniversary of El Paso. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Cindy. Um, okay, so I think we are at time. I do want to acknowledge the, our DI working group members. Um, we do have a question in the queue that I can tee up very quickly before we move to concluding remarks. Um, and this question is from our chair of the working group, Rudy Brioche. If you'd like to chime in here, Rudy, feel free. Um, but his question is, what single library program or partnership that your organization relies on the most? So is there a, a specific program or partnership um, with a library that your organization relies on the most? It's one of our uh, committee questions. And that's open to everyone. I would just say to Rudy's question, uh, Rudy, ours is just based on the different MBK communities and their own connections to the libraries within their, their communities. Uh, we've we've done work with uh, New York Library, for example, with the New York MBK uh, communities all across uh, the city in different boroughs. But otherwise, it really is based on local relationships in terms of libraries. And and Laura, I, I just want to mention that because we haven't been able to work through the schools, which is normally how our coding programs and other programs work, we have to find um, where the students are that need. Our, our work um, and usually it's much easier when you're working through a school system because they're all there already uh, so in order to do that we've had to get creative with partnerships like with the YWCA and others and libraries uh, and museums have become essential as part of that because they already have a list of people that have normally been going to those um, libraries and museums in order to get access to some of the programming that Emily and, and Cindy and we do. Um, so for instance, here in uh, Montgomery County where I live, there's the Kid Museum that's part of Davis Library. Um, and we've had to actually ask them for help in accessing the their networks that they have built over many, many years of physically having people there in terms of collaborating on a virtual program specific to the Latino community or underrepresented communities that they're also focused on. So I think it's even more important that these collaborations include libraries and museums, which in this case are combined. And I think more and more libraries are partnering with museums to give them additional capabilities as well in terms of the tech space and the, and the, and the maker space. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we are at the point where I am going to hand this conversation off to some of our fellow working group members, uh, Shelly Blakeney, Rory Litland, and also Jamila Best Johnson, who's our designated federal officer for this uh, working group and the committee at large. Uh, so with that said, I want to thank you very much for your participation. Um, Shelly and Roy will go through some summary points uh, related to both workshops, and we will close out our conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Hi. Hey, Shelly, we can hear you. Hey, okay, great.
Well, thank you Three so much. Start. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a fantastic, fantastic uh, discussion. Um, just trying to pull some of my notes up here. Um, there was so much fantastic discussion. <laughs> Not sure we're going to capture everything in our highlights, but what we wanted to do was just share a few of the resounding themes that we heard throughout today amongst our discussions, amongst the two panels, um, and talk a little bit about how we wanted to take these learnings and take them back to our working group for further discussion and for analysis, and um, also how we would like to continue uh, the partnership with all of the panelists that participated in today's, in today's workshop um, as we um, develop our you know, analysis for our final presentation uh, to the broader um, ACDDE committee and then ultimately to the commission. So with regard to panel one, I mean, the focus was on, on our, our libraries and how our libraries serve as anchor institutions. And, and for that, it was so informative, so much good information and, and, and just great discussion around the, the, the various programs and the creativity um, that all of the uh, participants here um, have displayed um, excellent supportive programs, um, all creating divisible, workable, forward-thinking initiatives, I thought, very much so, in, in serving the communities, um, both prior to the pandemic and, and now that we're in the midst of the, of the pandemic. Um, generally, uh, in terms of some of the, the, the resounding themes, I think that we, we heard from uh, workforce in skill development, training, um, increase uh, in reliance on library services um, during the COVID. In particular, uh, we talked and heard a lot from the panelists on um, the importance of connectivity services um, as a result of, of the pandemic. Um, we heard a lot about uh, digital literacy training programs in various libraries and, and, and looking at ways to ensure that continued um, education process. Um, we heard a lot about um, uh, support of connectivity programs, um, both with regard to equipment and, and, and services, including a lot about hot Wi-Fi hotspot lending programs and, and computer and tablet lending programs. In addition to um, generally, we heard a lot on, on connectivity services uh, within both within the confines of the physical library structure and beyond and beyond. Um, we delved a little bit into the policies, um, some of the federal um, policies and their interplay on funding of libraries, uh, specifically Library Services and Technologies Act, as well as the Institute of Museum and Library Services, E-Rate and other FCC and state policy initiatives. And we touched on how broadband um, in the presence of services, um, uh, what we see on tribal lands, which is a great conversation starter to an area that our working group intends to delve further into, into in the coming weeks. So I know my colleague Roy Litland is on as well and might wish to share a few thoughts generally. Thank sure. you. Sure. Yes, thanks Shelley. Yeah, so I think uh, just to, I'll hit on just a couple of the things that Shelley hit on. Um, uh, I think I was really just struck, I, I think I was aware of this, but that library services really go beyond the four walls and also with the other, with the nonprofits on this call. Um, it's on, both in terms of Wi-Fi for, from beyond the building, calling patrons, some more analog ways, maybe one of the best ways to increase digital literacy and inclusion or, or sort of the, the starting point for folks who aren't on. We're going to naturally have to reach out through analog methods and, and then we're hearing, hearing calling people. And then there was the uh, grow, grow with Google where, 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 where they were first advertising on Facebook, but then realized that they had to actually do radio and, and uh, newspaper. Um, and also I heard some discussion, particularly on the first panel, but I think this second panel as well, it's also all about sort of digital ambassadors in the community. So you, you can have these great online programs, you can have, a, have it at the library, but you really have to go 
meet people where they are. And that's really what the libraries are trying to do and what everyone on, on this panel is trying to do. Um, and then the other main point I'll hit is just that um, I think the importance of kind of knowing where broadband is and the FCC has got an effort right now, Congress passed a statute about broadband mapping and just getting, getting, that, getting that information out there so that when the hotspot, when the libraries do get hotspots, they can deploy them effectively. FCC, FCC and the providers are working on this issue. And then on the second panel, a reference was made to the nonprofits who are essentially following broadband deployment so that they can do their work. So I think as well, we heard a lot about sort of libraries taking on this unwanted role of the, being an ISP and they don't want to do that. And I think uh, broadband, broadband providers also would rather provide broadband um, as opposed to ha having libraries fill this role. So where there are gaps, hopefully we can, we can get the better maps and, and then leverage all these different FCC programs and whether it's subsidies through the Universal Service Fund or, or the CAF um, or other, other methods for, uh, to deploy broadband, just kind of get, get that out there, know where the information is, know where the broadband is, is actually, and, and um, that'll make all this work uh, more effective. So with that, I'll turn it over to Camilla Best Johnson. Thank you, Roy, and uh, thank you, Shelley, and thank you, Cindy. Well, we've had a terrific discussion today. Uh, thank you all, participants, panelists, moderators, for a lively, very important conversation around digital adoption and literacy. And I think that we're having this conversation now as we continue to work and live through this health crisis, as well as against the backdrop of social justice demonstrations is crucial. To all of our panelists for the work that you do in this particular moment. We invite everyone to visit the Advisory Committee's website at www.fcc.gov for the bios of our speakers today and more resources on libraries and broadband. And if you'll please allow me just quickly to thank all of the others who were integral to our great event today, beginning with Michelle Carey, Media Bureau Chief. Sarah Whitesell, Deputy Chief of the Media Bureau, Brendan Holland, Chief of the Industry Analysis Division, Julie Saunier and Jamil Cadre, Deputy Designated Federal Officers, Ben Thompson, FCC IT Team, Jeff Reardon, Steve Baldwin, Balderson, I'm sorry, Steve, Greg Huff of the FCC's Meeting Room Team. Also from the Media Bureau, I'd like to thank Vanessa LeMay, Christina Gavin, India Malcolm, and Brenda Lewis. And lastly, a special thanks to our chair, Anna Gomez, for her leadership support, to our vice chair, Heather Gates, for her help designing these panels. Uh, we send you our warm wishes for a speedy recovery, Heather. To Rudy Brioche, our fearless DEI working group chair, to her rent contractor, and Laura Barakal, our, our co-lead on broadband inclusion, and to our DEI members, Felicia West, Roy Litlin, Cindy Benavides, and alternate member Shelley Blakeney, and to all of the DEI working group members who have worked so diligently in preparing this topic for public discussion. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Rudy, Anna, any closing thoughts? Sure, just a couple of, of quick a few words. Um, I did actually raise the bar for this panel to say that you had to match uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the level of insight of the previous panel. Um, I'm pleased to report that you actually met and exceeded that. That was a truly enriching discussion. I have to say I was very impressed with the fact that Broderick actually reached out beyond the scope and talked about the impact of, you know, in terms of mental health. Uh, that's an area that, frankly, was one that I completely did not even consider going into this panel. And when I heard that, I thought that that is so important because we know that there is also a mental health challenge that comes along with everything else that we're experiencing, whether it's, you know, other health uh, issues related to COVID, uh, you know, the economic uh, and the racial uh, strife, all that you know, results in a certain level of trauma. So I think that's really an important point. And we all know that we have people in families who are experiencing that in many different ways. When I started off, I said that we we're actually looking at this from a human perspective. Uh, and I think that point really epitomizes that human element that we need to consider as we you know, have this very enriching discussion with a great deal of you know, technologists, with librarians, um, with uh, folks who are on the ground who are really deploying programs 
that are meaningful to people of all different stripes and backgrounds. So thank you very much for that enriching perspective you provided. Uh, now it's our work to essentially follow up with you. We'll probably follow up with a few additional questions, uh, request for some information to help um, you know, support uh, the work that we do as we develop a report and recommendations to the FCC. So thank you very much for being part of this process. Yeah, I'd like to echo uh, Rudy and Jamila in saying my thanks. This has been an inc incredible workshop. Um, and one of the things that I, uh, and I want to underscore what Rudy just said is um, how important each of the organizations that spoke, whether it's the libraries or the community organizations, uh, how important they are to people's individual lives. And there are a lot of people suffering out there. So this was a really good time for us to be able to shine a light on the important work that you're doing, as well as to learn as we come up with our recommendations for the FCC um, and, and whatever work products we come out of, of this to uh, develop reports on, on best practices and other recommended actions that we can take to support um, the communities uh, that we discussed today. So thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Um, and I thank, again, our working group members. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much.